Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that uh, the board members had a chance to grab uh, something quickly to eat. And uh, it was a pretty fast paced uh, time period in between here, but um, that's okay. And this afternoon's meeting um, is really focused on um, response to COVID-19 um, by the carriers. And I have to say that um, people have continued to impress and surpass expectations during this crisis. Um, and in my limited conversations with insurers, I wanna thank them for the quick actions that they have taken, um, whether it was giving people the ability to get 180 day fills of prescriptions, whether it was um, loosening the rules on telehealth, um, at a time when they too were trying to grapple with stay at home orders and how to do things remotely, um, trying to do everything within their power to make sure that um, there was not a huge lag in payments to providers. Um, these are things that um, have truly impressed me that uh, people have really come to the forefront. And before we even hear from them, I wanna uh, thank them um, on behalf of all Vermonters for what has been done so far. With that in mind, we also um, have a, a point in time now where we have seen providers losing revenues, um, sometimes more than half of their previous revenues. And it's a time where we know that um, under the Affordable Care Act, there has to be at least an 80% MLR ratio um, for the QHP offerings, but also it's a time for us to uh, reflect on what could be done to make sure if, and I, re I have to say if, there is a windfall to insurers. We don't know. We don't know if there will be a drop off of uh, membership. We don't know um, the final results but it's a, a good place to uh, start to have the conversation. And it really should be a comprehensive one where everyone is at the table and trying to have that discussion. But the main point for today was to get input from all the, the three major carriers on what they have done in response to COVID today and really to learn from them. And uh, the great starting place is with our commissioner from the Department of Financial Regulation. And I have to say that um, Mike Pichak has stepped up um, from the beginning of this crisis, has really um, done yeoman's work in creating uh, data analytics to look at so people are making intelligent decisions. And um, just someone that um, I always respected before, but um, my respect for him has grown in leaps and bounds over the course of the uh, past uh, six weeks, I guess. And um, with that, we're gonna start this afternoon with Commissioner Pichak. And Mike, are you ready and do you have control so that you can uh, share your presentation? We're not hearing anything from you, Mike. Well, while Mike tries to figure out how to get control of his presentation and we can hear him, I'm going to turn it over to Susan Barrett for a quick executive director's report, which I was going to save to the end. <laughs> We are nimble here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know that um, Commissioner Pichek is on the line and he does have a presentation that I think Abigail can help him um, put up on the screen and share as well as put up on our website for those on the line to follow along. Um, I have a few brief announcements. First, that our um, May schedule is posted on our website, our, our um, Meetings for May uh, are subject to change and some are to, the, to be determined, but just to announce here in a public setting that on May 6th, Wednesday at 1 p.m., 
the board will uh, discuss updated budget guidance for 2021. In, uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have um, gone back and updated our budget guidance. So that's the topic on May 6th. On May 13th at 1 p.m., we're gonna hear from an outside expert who does national work across the country on national trends in state affordability and sustainability strategies. This is something we've been working on uh, well before the COVID pandemic. And I think it will be very interesting um, in light of the pandemic to hear what he has to say. And then on Wednesday, May 20th, uh, we have a primary care advisory group meeting scheduled at 5 p.m. in the evening uh, till 7 p.m. All of these meetings are via Skype and all of the information is listed on our website under our May public uh, board meeting press release. I also want to announce that after the meeting we had this morning, we have uh, posted a special public comment period for a rate increase request from Northwest Medical Center. That public comment period ha has begun and is in effect until Monday, May 4th at 8 a.m. And all of the information and materials can be found on our website under special public comment period. And uh, I think I can turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Hopefully Commissioner Pichek is on the line. So before we go back to Commissioner Pichak, I'm gonna do a couple things. We're gonna um, take a vote on the minutes of April 22nd. And also Susan, I'm gonna throw it back to you to call the attendance so that Abigail can have an accurate record um, of who is participating today. Sure. So, members of the board, is there a motion on the minutes of Wednesday, April 22nd? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, April 22nd without any deletions, corrections, or additions. Um, is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, Susan, if you could take the attendance. Sure. I'm gonna uh, call out the last four numbers of the uh, phone number that I see on our line, and I'll start with 3212, if you could let me know who that belongs to. Yes, hi, uh, it's Kathy Mahoney. Thank you, Kathy. And then we have 7632. Hi, Susan, this is Jeff Tiemann from the Hospital Association. Hi, Jeff. We have 3452. This is Rebecca Copan with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. Okay. We have five, oops, I'm seeing my light. Hmm. Sorry about that, my screen is, uh, we have 2307. Hi, this is Don George from Blue Cross Blue Shield of okay. Vermont. Thank you. Um, I think I did 5572, <clears throat> Christine Cooney from Cigna. Okay, thank you. 2438. Two, three, four, eight. It's Dr. Care, Sigma Health. Oops, two, four, three, eight, sorry. Okay, great. And then I think I just had, I think I've gotten everybody. I also see um, uh, Pierce Lingenfelter. Yes, that's Dr. Pierce. Okay. And then we have Nolan Langwell, Orca Media. Looks like we have Dr. Wasserman and Susan Grykowski. I think all of the presenters are also listed on our agenda. Uh, Sarah Teachout. Is there anyone else that we are missing or joined since I called out the numbers? Hi, Anthony Calley from Cigna has joined as well. Great. Uh, Jen Collins. Go ahead. Jen Collis, EVM Medical Center. Thank you. Uh, Josh Clavin, Blue Cross on the phone. Hi, Josh. Okay, anyone else? Yeah, Kate McIntosh, Blue Cross. 
And for MVP, we have Dr. Kim Kilby and Rich Odorizzi on as well. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else? If not, I'm going to try one more time to throw it back to Commissioner Pichak. And uh, Mike, are you able to uh, grab control of the screen? Mike, now can you, you hear me? Able, now you should be able to hear me. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank Excellent. you. Sorry, sorry about that. I, um, you know, sometimes technology is our friend and sometimes not so much. So I, um, I, I'm on my iPad, which seems to have worked for the audio and the visual, and I'm going to try to share my screen on my desktop for the presentation, um, and I hope that will, will work. I can also, this is Susan Barrett, um, I can send a copy to all of the board members and it will be, I think if it hasn't already, it's been posted to our website. But Great. let's see if we can share it. Um, if you can't share it, uh, Commissioner Pichek, Abigail can go ahead and share it for you. If that, that would be, be great. Easier. Yeah, it looks like um, there's some privacy settings on my computer that's making okay. it challenging. So. Great. Abigail, okay, so can you go ahead and do that? I'm doing it now. Great. Thank you, Abigail. Okay. Can everyone see that? We can. Great. Uh, well, again, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mullen. Thank you, the members of the Green Mountain Care Board and um, those uh, in attendance as well. Um, really appreciate the opportunity for uh, the department to talk a little bit about what um, we've been up to on the healthcare side uh, over the last six weeks. Um, I did hear at the beginning, uh, Chair, the comments that you made uh, to the industry stakeholders, and I'll just reiterate those off the top of the bat that, you know, we um, have been really um, pleased with the amount of communication and the amount of cooperation that we've received over the last six weeks. Um, you know, it's, it's always important to have communication. It's always important to have cooperation, but in times of crisis, it's sometimes difficult to um, maintain that and facilitate that in a thoughtful and collaborative way. Uh, and uh, certainly some folks on my team, Sebastian and Emily, have done a great job uh, helping keep that uh, discussion alive, but um, certainly willing participants on the, uh, on the insurer side and on the other state stakeholder side uh, have been critical uh, as well. So I do want to thank um, everyone at the top uh, here. So Abigail, if we could go to my, the, net, the first slide, um, I just will talk a little bit about the, basically the two things that I was hoping to cover here. Uh, one was to talk about the um, emergency actions that the department uh, has taken to date um, from the beginning of the pandemic here in Vermont in early March uh, up through uh, last week. <clears throat> and then also talk a little bit about the financial impacts that COVID-19 is having on health insurers. And for that piece of it, um, you know, I'm really talking at a, a sort of a 30,000 foot view. Um, and talking about information that we have at a national level. And the reason I'm doing that is just because there's so much um, that's volatile at this point, both in terms of the severity of, of, of all these different sort of metrics that I'll talk about, and also the timing of them. We don't know um, on the severity front if, uh, if we'll see a, uh, sort of a, um, a peak of cost, you know, over the summer or whether that will be over the fall and winter or whether we're really – in for a longer experience, like 18 months, uh, for a number of these different metrics, whether they're health metrics or economic met metrics. Um, so I will talk about that in a broad sense and uh, give you a sense of where um, our insurance companies were going into the crisis, uh, the various elements that are going to impact them because of the crisis, and then um, it's certainly an open question about, you know, where do they all stand now um, and where are they all going? But I think we can all say with confidence they went into the crisis in a good financial position, 
uh, and we're all uh, comfortable and confident that they will uh, emerge from the crisis in a strong financial position and continue to be able to deliver um, the important services and work that they do for Vermonters. Uh, so Abigail, if we could go down the next slide. Um, this is really just overviewing um, the process that the department has had in place uh, since uh, the beginning of March. I mentioned it has been a collaborative and thoughtful process. Um, since March 9th, we've had weekly DFR stakeholder meetings. Uh, again, Sebastian and Emily have taken the lead on that and done a great job of uh, getting um, a lot of good feedback and also getting a lot of good buy-in from all of these uh, critical stakeholders. Um, we really are discussing operational issues, but discussing policy issues as they've come about and been implemented uh, as well. And we have representatives from the provider community, from the commercial insurance marketplace, other state uh, representatives as well. So that's been a critical key in all of this. We've also received strong legislative support, so we appreciate that. Um, elements of uh, what we've done, uh, we already had previous legal authority for. Um, we were able to receive agreement on other items, but the legislature also provided us some additional uh, authorization, particularly around telemedicine uh, cost uh, treatment or cost sharing for COVID-19, uh, and also some authority around uh, cost sharing for pharmaceuticals, which we'll get into. But their responsiveness and work has been great as well. So, um, you know, that's what you like to see in a crisis is people uh, stepping up and pitching in. So Abigail, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, this is really talking about the actions that DFR took uh, in early March through mid-March. But, you know, right out of the bat, uh, right out of the gate, the department um, issued a bulletin um, that required uh, commercial insurers to cover the cost of uh, COVID-19 uh, testing, um, whether those tests are performed at a, a testing center approved by the CDC or the Vermont Health Department. Um, with no uh, co-payment, co-insurance, or deductible. So we thought this was a really important thing to do early on to make sure there were not financial barriers to getting testing, um, that, that uh, people had confidence in that. Um, Medicare and Medicaid were able to provide similar assurances um, based on the way their programs were already structured. Um, and then the state of Vermont also committed to picking up the cost of anyone that's uninsured as well. So we really were able to get sort of a wide universal coverage on the testing front, which was an important um, consideration early on in the pandemic. Um, similarly, in, in mid-March, we um, took another action that we thought was important, um, both from a policy standpoint, but also from a, you know, from a, uh, uh, just attacking the disease standpoint, trying to get people to be as safe as possible and secure in their homes and as possible. Uh, so this was a prescription drug refill. Um, the chair mentioned this at the top. Uh, we basically um, had a requirement that uh, an individual could have at least a 30-day supply, but there was additional flexibility um, at the individual pharmacy level as well to go out uh, much beyond that. So this, again, a, an important um, policy initiative so that uh, people are making less trips to the pharmacy, um, particularly those that are vulnerable. Uh, they may very well want to be staying home and staying safe. Uh, they might not have uh, pharmaceuticals mailed to them or delivered to them. Uh, so this allows them to uh, get a, um, a sufficient supply for their uh, important medication uh, and ensuring that they don't have to go out uh, and do that with regularity. Um, we also reached an agreement in mid-March about expanded coverage and reimbursement for telemedicine. Um, making uh, that expand to uh, telephone only, email, um, fax, uh, were clinically uh, appropriate. So that was an agreement that we reached. We also came out with an emergency rule, um, which I will mention in a minute. So I think, Abigail, we can go to the next slide. So these are the actions that we took in, in mid-March to late March. Um, we suspended uh, the routine provider uh, audits uh, by insurers. Uh, so we uh, wanted providers to be able to focus on the pandemic full uh, full attention, uh, that they didn't have, um, that they weren't required to be responding uh, to things that didn't um, have an immediacy in terms of its impact or its, or its importance. Obviously, these audits are important, uh, but given the current uh, situation and status, uh, thought that those could be uh, delayed to allow providers um, the opportunity to fully focus on their work 
Um, so those uh, routine provider audits uh, were suspended. Um, similarly, uh, we suspended uh, the credentialing verification practices for insurers. Um, under telemedicine, uh, a lot of different um, providers opened up uh, because uh, you know, some people may be uh, living in New Hampshire but getting treated in Vermont, uh, but now they're getting treated in New Hampshire because they're not visiting the doctor's office. They're staying in their home uh, in uh, New Hampshire and vice versa. We have borders, obviously, that um, have a lot of people that travel across them with great frequency. Uh, so it was important to make sure that uh, the credentialing requirements were able to facilitate uh, this reimbursement uh, during the state of emergency. Uh, again, another um, important sort of uh, policy uh, framework. Um, we also uh, put out a request for flexibility uh, around um, grace periods on premium payments. Uh, so we left it to uh, the health insurers to figure out what that means for themselves and their financial position. But basically those that are uh, in a position of um, not being able to pay due to financial circumstances, you know, there is um, some ability to have some flexibility there. Um, similarly, with our banks and our credit unions, you know, they want to provide flexibility um, to those that are really facing severe hardship. Uh, but of course, we need to continue to have people that can continue to pay to pay so that all of our financial institutions are in a position uh, to continue to pay, uh, to continue to provide the services that they are and to provide any flexibility uh, that they can. Um, so Abigail, if we go to the next slide. This sort of wraps up uh, the DFR work. Um, we issued the emergency telehealth uh, regulation in late March, like we uh, had mentioned, we had reached a previous agreement on. Um, that, uh, again, a very helpful item. Uh, on April 14th, we issued an emergency regulation relating to the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention uh, of COVID-19. So this is not just the testing, but also the treatment, and that was retroactive uh, to March 13th, the date of the state of emergency. Uh, so any Vermonter that um, has required hospitalization or other inpatient care uh, that is a member of, um, you know, one of our uh, commercial insurers in a fully funded plan uh, will not have any cost shares uh, associated in the future and uh, will have that money um, reimbursed if paid out uh, from a visit in, in March as well. So that, again, was a critical policy choice, um, not just sort of the right thing to do, but also uh, eliminates financial barriers for people to get the treatment that they need uh, so that they can get better health outcomes and be seen more quickly. Uh, again, in an effort to get our hands around this pandemic as quickly as possible. So um, uh, the right thing to do, like I said, but also an important uh, piece of the puzzle in terms of fighting the virus and the pandemic. We also uh, issued a bulletin regarding the payment for out-of-network uh, ambulance services. Uh, this was clarifying um, some confusion around uh, when an out-of-network uh, ambulance service provides an emergency uh, medical treatment to a member, uh, that it's our view that uh, under Vermont law, uh, the requirement is for the health insurer to reimburse the uh, ambulance provider directly for the cost of those services rather uh, than having the payment run through the member. That has provided some, that has presented some confusion we understand um, in the past and wanted to provide that uh, with some clarity. Um, the only other item that is on the radar at the current moment uh, is around emergency rules on, on pharmacy cost sharing. Um, we were granted this authority uh, under uh, Act 91 that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I know there was some testimony on this item as well. Um, from our perspective, we're trying to make sure we understand the population that potentially would be impacted uh, by waiving the pharmacy cost share. Um, people that have had their incomes uh, go away or significantly uh, depleted, uh, there are opportunities for them to get on Medicaid and have a cost share and arrangement, not just on pharmacy, but on other medical services that's probably more beneficial than um, a commercial policy. Uh, so that's a population, obviously, that we're all concerned if somebody loses their job, but there's options for them uh, as uh, the current framework exists. Uh, also, somebody that might have a chronic medical condition, again, it's likely that they've already hit their deductible for plan year 2020, 
uh, at this point uh, due to how low the out-of-pocket costs are in Vermont. I think it's just over $1,400 uh, for, the, for the deductible. So um, again, with those sort of two populations we think already having options available to them, uh, we're looking at whether we need to do any action in this space. Um, and if action is needed, um, trying to make it as narrowly tailored as possible um, so that we are uh, getting a benefit uh, to, those, uh, to that population that we think needs um, this benefit. So we will have more to come on that, but that um, is sort of a, uh, to be determined at this moment. So Abigail, if we go to the next slide, uh, basically everything I just ran through was, was everything the department has done and happy to take questions now or take questions at the end as well. Uh, but I do want to transition into the financial impact component. And again, I'm going to keep this high level and, and obviously every uh, insurer that you'll hear from today will have an opportunity to expand on this or be more specific about their situation to the extent that they uh, would like to be or are comfortable uh, doing so at this moment. But this is a snapshot of where our, of the three insurers that you'll hear today and the three major insurers in the Vermont marketplace stood as of uh, the end of the year 2019. Um, you'll see that uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, MVP, and Cigna, uh, they all had uh, healthy surpluses. Um, they all had uh, strong uh, risk-based capital ratios. Um, we've just put them in there as a range. Um, and you'll see again that they uh, are in a solid position. We talked about, I think you're all familiar with the risk-based capital ratio, um, but just to put a finer point on that for anyone else that's listening, uh, this is a ratio that uh, is used by insurance regulators across the country. Um, from a regulatory standpoint, uh, when things, uh, when the RBC gets into the 200s or quickly falls into the 200s or even 300s, um, there are certain regulatory actions that are either allowed or required, and particularly when it falls into the 100s or below. Um, so when a company is sitting in the uh, 500s or 400s, you know, that is a, a solid um, place to exist. Uh, sometimes we want to see a company based on its particular risk factor to be higher, to be in the 600s or potentially even in the 700s, depending on the risk factors. Um, but it's safe to say that going into the crisis, uh, our insurance companies were in a strong uh, financial position. So if we can go to the next slide, Abigail, this is really, again, the high-level um, analysis of what are the headwinds that are facing insurers across the country, uh, but also obviously those uh, in Vermont as well. So if we take, you know, their pre-COVID-19 financial condition and then think about what are the things that have impacted them over the last uh, four months or so, Certainly at the top of that list are COVID-19 related claims. Um, that's both on the testing and on the treatment side. So on the testing side, you know, Vermont has um, done about 15,000 tests. Obviously not all of those tests were done by um, people that belong to a fully insured commercial plan, but there's 15,000 tests that have been, been conducted. So there is an expense there, but the state is also, like every other state, looking to ramp up its ability to conduct more tests with more frequency as part of the reopening strategy. So testing and the expenses associated with testing will certainly be around for quite some time. A greater expense, though, obviously, is the treatment. Um, treatment can be quite expensive. We'll talk about that again on, on some national figures in a minute. But the treatment can be quite expensive. Um, obviously, we've had people requiring hospitalization, requiring ICU treatment, uh, requiring ventilators, um, people that are still in the hospital today and people that will um, unfortunately need hospital care for COVID-19, likely um, throughout the summer and into the fall and winter. The real question is how severe will um, the, the virus be uh, in the summer and how severe will the virus be in the fall and the winter? Uh, those are just question marks that we can't answer at this time. Um, but obviously, if we have a, a severe second wave, um, regardless of if that's in October or November, or if we have a resurgence in the summer, that's obviously going to have an impact uh, on the financial side uh, in terms of, of getting everybody treated and getting everybody the medical care that they need. So those are two items at the top of the list that, again, have some variability as it relates to the severity of, of how much more uh, will be required of health insurers from a financial standpoint, 
and the timing of, of that as well. Um, the investment portfolio performance, again, another measure that's important to watch. We'll get into this in more detail, but um, obviously I think everyone that's watched their own retirement account knows that the stock market has not performed well uh, over the course of 2020. We are back a little bit in April. It is back a little bit today as well. Uh, so it's trending in the right direction, but it's still down um, at least double digits from its high point uh, earlier in the year. Uh, so most of our health insurers, like a lot of our insurance companies more broadly, have a more limited exposure to the equity markets, but still there's an impact there um, when you're talking about uh, an impact on the general financial condition. Uh, some of the emergency regulations that we've issued also have a financial component. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking of the treatment zero cost share. You know, the treatment, again, is, is expensive, and, and to eliminate the cost share certainly has a price tag with it as well. Again, we think it's certainly the right policy and the right decision um, and is helping us fight the virus, uh, but it's important uh, to remember uh, that that also comes uh, with a, a, a price tag. Uh, looking into the future a little bit, um, there are a couple of uh, items that were included in the CARES Act that was passed in late March that impacts commercial insurers. One um, is the uh, definition, definitional change or, or clarification that a COVID-19 vaccine would be considered a preventative service and therefore provided um, to an individual at zero cost share. So um, if you can think of that and think of when a vaccine might be online, let's assume it's uh, the same price as the flu shot, which very well could be more expensive, but you know, you might be talking about um, millions and millions of dollars in order to get everybody uh, their vaccine um, when that comes online. So again, that's a, co a cost that's out there. We don't know when, uh, we don't know how much that cost will be. We don't know when that will be incurred, but it's something that um, exists that we have to take into account. Uh, the same thing with the serological testing. So this is the testing that is done after the fact to determine if somebody has antibodies uh, in their blood. Uh, for the virus. Um, we haven't had widespread serological testing in Vermont, uh, but again, the CARES Act included language around um, uh, providing those serological tests from commercial insurers with the zero cost share. So something else from a price tag uh, and financial impact standpoint that um, we need to be mindful of. So those are all the things that have impacted insurers, you know, um, from a, from a negative financial standpoint. Uh, one thing that has obviously impacted providers from a negative financial uh, impact is the reduction in non-COVID-19 related activity, claims, treatments, elective surgeries, and the like. Um, that has uh, something that has accrued to the benefit of health insurers um, because again, um, those claims are not coming in. Uh, but the question there again remains, you know, if we do have a, um, a reopening of elective surgeries over the summertime and people are comfortable going to the hospital and getting those surgeries, you know, to what degree does this pent up demand uh, get met completely in the summer or in the fall uh, or in the winter? Um, or to what extent um, does some of that demand fall off? Uh, to what extent do we not have enough capacity in our hospital system to to do all of the current demand plus the pent up demand. That's just an open question as to um, what will happen when we get back to sort of a, a new normal standpoint. Um, again, in terms of the severity and in terms of the timing, both of those things are unknown at this point, um, but it's something we have to watch uh, closely. So um, Abigail, if we can go to the next slide, uh, there is an opportunity here just to provide some specific numbers, at least from a national standpoint, to put some context around some of these items we just talked about. So you can see the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services, CMS, uh, published a reimbursement payment for uh, Medicare, um, and that was about $35 uh, for uh, CDC-approved tests and a little bit more for non-CDC-approved tests. So you can get a sense of what the cost is uh, from a Medicare reimbursement standpoint. Um, commercial, uh, or sorry, na some national hospitals I have seen charging uh, 100 to 150 to $200 to run 
a, a COVID lab test. So the price is a little bit variable there, but I think it's safe to say that um, it's not an insignificant expense. Uh, again, when you add in uh, some of the other uh, requirements under the CARES Act, uh, things like uh, payments for um, services and screenings that are provided sort of uh, ancillary to a, a COVID test, uh, then again, there can be some uh, greater um, greater impact uh, from our for our health insurers. Uh, the treatment side of it, the treatment side I mentioned is more expensive, and you can get this picture pretty clearly. I think um, there are a few surveys out there. One suggests that the cost of a of an in person in person seven day stay per patient is about thirty eight thousand um, dollars. So you take that and and figure how many people have been in the hospital and how many people are gonna require hospitalization over the next you know, few months to the next year, depending on when a vaccine is available and, 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 or, and or more treatment, better treatment is available. Um, and that is not obviously an insignificant number. I've seen other estimates that put the, the cost of a hospital stay even uh, more significantly higher than that, almost double, over $70,000. Uh, so again, that's a that's a real impact that um, I know our health insurers are watching closely, uh, as are we. If we can go to the next slide, uh, Abigail, this will talk about the uh, investment component. So I mentioned that um, you know uh, again from the inf this is from the information as of the filings that these companies have made at the end of the year, um, and it just really talks about their investment portfolios and what percentage of their investment portfolios are. Uh, in the bond market, in the equity market, or in some alternative market, or in cash. And you can see that uh, all of the insurers have the greatest share of their um, portfolio in the bond market. Uh, I'll talk about this in a minute, but the bond market has had some mixed results with certain bonds performing favorably, others uh, not as much. So it's been a mixed result, um, but um, probably not going to see much of an impact from that bond perspective, at least relative to the equities. The equities, um, like I said, they have been hit a little bit harder. Um, and then the alternative investments that, that uh, companies might have is really dependent on uh, what are in those alternatives. But if we can go to the next slide, I'll just again briefly show what has uh, sort of been the impact. You'll see that on the bond performance, um, corporate bonds, strong corporate bonds, government bonds have performed well, uh, corporate bonds, or high yield bonds that are not as, you know, corporate bonds that are not as strong or high yield bonds have not performed as well uh, year to date. Uh, so depending on the mixture that a, a, a company uh, nationally has, uh, that will depend on how the performance uh, is on that metric. From an equity standpoint, you can see the S&P 500 again is down this year, uh, double digits, about 12%, although it's up again today. Um, and it's bouncing back from its low. Uh, but again, that will have an impact on a uh, company's um, financial position as well. And we don't know what the economic future holds, I think, as everyone on the phone can appreciate. We don't know if um, we will um, quickly rebound from a, from a real economy standpoint and whether the financial markets will follow suit. Uh, don't know if it will be a, a slower um, you know, recovery uh, or what that financial an economic recovery looks like. So that, um, again, is something that we have to keep a close eye on um, as we go forward. If we can go to the next slide, uh, Abigail, this will uh, talk about uh, just a couple of other financial impacts I'll hit on very quickly. Again, we already touched on this, but there's some requirements under the CARES Act and the emergency reactions that the department has taken that will, uh, that will have a financial impact to these insurers, uh, mostly around the testing uh, for the vaccine or sorry, the testing for, ser for serological testing, but then also the vaccine under the CARES Act. And I think most prominently the uh, waiver of cost sharing uh, for the treatment, uh, diagnosis and prevention of uh, COVID-19 as well. So if we can go to the, the next slide, uh, this is really shifting again. We've, we have been talking about all of the um, impacts for health insurers uh, now we're really looking at the impacts to providers in terms of negative consequences. Um, and to health insurers, these are really um, in some way viewed, could be viewed as short-term benefits. But again, we have to see what, um, how long uh, these drastic reductions in claims last and, and how quickly they rebound and, and how they rebound when things get back to a more normal state. 
but you'll see here, this is the number of visits to ambulatory practices um, beginning sometime in the middle part of February. Again, this is national data. Companies might want to provide a more um, specific analysis of how uh, they're experiencing this. But you can see how it drops off quite precipitously um, right around the time that the states of emergencies are being declared across the country and the virus is getting more severe and elective surgeries are being postponed um, and uh, drops all the way down to just about 60 percent. So pretty significant drop off nationally. You can see that it has stabilized and even ticked up a little bit. Um, that could be, you know, due to a number of reasons, better um, familiarity and, and use of telemedicine. Um, maybe there are some, there's some greater comfort now that uh, some places haven't experienced the virus as significantly as others for people to go into um, the hospital or other facilities to get treatment. But obviously, it's still rather significant and far off the base um, that it uh, was expected in late February. So, Abigail, if we go to the next slide, this is really looking at it on a regional basis. <clears throat> so, again, not great news for us here in the Northeast, but I think because we experienced COVID-19 so severely compared to some other parts in the country, not really Vermont, fortunately, but certainly uh, New York and uh, certainly Connecticut and Rhode Island and, and Massachusetts, you can see that the number of visits in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic are actually um, – the, uh, the decline is the greatest uh, in the country here in, in New England and the Mid-Atlantic states. So um, again, I think this can be attributable to the uh, impact of the virus more globally in our region. Um, the swift action that governors took to stop elective surgeries for, and, and such, and even hospital systems took to prevent elective surgeries. I think the combination of that quick early intervention along with um, some more significant uh, virus spread uh, in the Northeast probably is attributing to that uh, more significant impact here. And then if we can go to the last slide, uh, Abigail, this is talking about um, how does telemedicine factor into this. And you can see that telemedicine helps improve the number of, of claims, if you will, if you're thinking about it from a who's getting a health care, who, who needs health care that's getting it. And from a provider perspective, it's improving uh, slightly, but Again, this is national data, and, it's, and it suggests that there are still a significant number of claims that are not, or treatments or visits that are not happening uh, that would normally have happened during the last, let's call it, four to five weeks. And, you know, there's a couple of considerations there. We talked about the timing of all of this. What, when do we get back to a more normal state? Um, do we really have the capacity to not just get to 100 on this chart, but to exceed you know, 100 to sort of make up for some of that pent up demand. I think that's uh, yet to be seen. I think what also is yet to be seen is will there be, what will the impacts be of, of individuals who didn't get wellness visits, didn't get early intervention in some of their care, and do they have more significant and severe non-COVID related medical incidents over the next few months that um, you know, uh, have an impact on, on everything that we've talked about today. So that's, again, something that we have to keep in mind and, and keep a close eye on. But, um, you know, I don't think we will have the answers to these important questions for, um, you know, probably many months if, if we're lucky, but it could be uh, beyond that as well. So I think that is everything I wanted to touch upon, uh, Chair Mullen. If, if you or the other board members have any questions, I'm obviously happy to take those. Sure. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it was an excellent primer on uh, what you're seeing, and uh, I realize that we have to uh, make decisions uh, based on uh, realistic data, and there's just not enough of it yet. I can tell you, though, from what I'm hearing um, and seeing when in our discussions and overview of hospitals that uh, certainly um, – the five or 10 or whatever percent that is unnecessary utilization has been taken out of the system. And, uh, you know, these numbers um, are actually low in comparison to some of the drops in revenues that we're hearing from independent practices and from hospitals. And, you know, um, I received my check from my auto insurer um, the other day for two months reduction in premium. And it seems like uh, 
we have to, to walk very, very carefully. But if we walk too slowly, um, are there chances that um, there will be allowed a windfall to carriers because not everyone um, will be treated equally and fairly? So for example, we have, um, and, and I'm, I know you're aware of this, but in our rate process, we get to look at the um, individual, small group, and large group, but we don't get to look at the ERISA plans. And will there be a windfall for some of the carriers in those ERISA plans if there isn't some type of enforcement action taken by DFR? So a good question, and just to just to set the context on the auto side, just so everyone's familiar, um, you know, Allstate was the first out of the gate with providing a, a refund. Um, those refunds had to be approved by our department. Um, we quickly, within two hours, approved the Allstate plan, and we put out a press release saying we encouraged all other insurers to follow suit. We intentionally provided flexibility so that they could decide what was appropriate for them and their customers. We now have 90% of the market on the auto side, uh, you know, with an approved plan that is a, equals about $15 million in refunds to Vermonters. So that's a great thing. Um, but the thing that I think we want to keep in mind about auto insurance and even commercial insurance and worker comp as well, because we're working on those areas, there are people that just don't have the same risk profile, whether it's because you're driving less or because your business isn't open or because your employees are furloughed that the same risk that presented in February just doesn't exist in March and April. So on the PNC side, that's very clear. I mean, you can, you can you know for certainty that, you know, the significant decline in driving will mean those claims will never happen. You know, there's not going to be an uptick in driving. And even if there is, you know, you're not going to see claims that are outpacing what has already, um, you know, gone away in terms of normal claim volume. So we're very confident in the PNC side that, you know, these policyholders paid for 12 months of coverage, and they're likely only going to need nine and a half months of coverage because two and a half months of which they were locked up at home and, you know, a stay home, stay safe order or just, you know, protecting themselves and staying home anyway. So that's not as clear. That picture is not as clear on the health insurer side. Um, they're, you know, unlike the PNC marketplace with auto insurers, um, they're not right in the middle of this hurricane that's circling around uh, everyone. The health insurers are. They're dealing with the COVID-19 uh, response. They're dealing uh, with those claims. But then they're also dealing with all this other sort of fallout that everybody else is dealing with as well. So um, we want to make sure ultimately that our health insurers are strong, uh, that they are solvent, that they're able to take care of um, all of their customers. Um, and I'm confident that they can do that. Um, and we will just need more time to determine if there's going to be any any windfall, uh, so to speak, to insurance companies. As it relates to the ERISA plans. So just to follow up on that, though, yeah. Mike, um, what we do know is that there has been a tremendous drop in utilization over the last six weeks and likely to continue for a while further. We're also hearing from hospital executives like Steve Leffler and Tom D, who believe very strongly that there's going to be an inherent um, fear of, Vermonters to go into doctors' offices and hospitals for some time to come until there are sufficient treatments and vaccines, and that um, it may not be a short-term effect. The auto insurers gave us a two-month rebate. It seems likely that there ought to be some analogy to the health insurers as far as some type of short-term um, rebate that could occur. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that as well. <laughs> Sorry, I had a, we had an, I had an anxious dog in here, so he had to go out. Oh, <laughs> we've all been through that over the last six weeks. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't like your question. I don't know. Maybe it was just, uh... <laughs> <But>. <laughs> So, yeah, so I just, again, I, I, I think it's not, I think that analysis could very well prove to be true, that even if elective surgeries are allowed to begin again in June, there might be Vermonters that are uncomfortable going to the hospital. Um, so you might not even be back to full capacity. And then 
the question is also what ability is there to make up for the um, claims that have dropped off, you know, over the last um, six weeks or so. So I think both of those are sound. We just don't know if that's going to happen. We just don't know what that progression will be. And it could very well be that, you know, we see a second wave that's significant and, and the insurers are being um, leaned on in a way that we don't currently anticipate. So, again, unlike um, auto insurers where we don't think they're going to be hit with some something specific to the pandemic, that they're going to have to pay out losses because of some specific pandemic-related issue, we do know that that's likely going to be the case for health insurers. So because they're right in the middle of this scenario, we really, in my opinion, we really want to make sure that they are um, well capitalized and strong financially. And then, you know, if at the appropriate point it becomes clear that there was an overpayment or there will definitely be, you know, um, an excess of, of a premium compared to claims, then I think it's totally appropriate to have those conversations. But again, I just think it's just a little too early with all the variables out there. Does DFR have the ability to retroactively seek a rebate for ERISA plans? So ERISA plans would be um, a little bit different, right? Because they the, ultimately the risk is is lying in those in those self-funded um, plans with the uh, with the businesses. So we um, we really don't, as a state, not just us, but you know any state actor, really have much authority over those ERISA plans. Um, so even if we wanted to order a, a rebate now or wanted to do something like that, we have we're quite limited by federal law in that point, unfortunately. Okay. Questions from the board? Um, I have a quick one. Oh, sorry. I'll I just start with one. Maureen first. Oh, thanks. Um, first, I, I think your presentation was really well done. It was really clear. And I liked the financial impacts for health insurers slide because I think that's something that, you know, we can track back to in the future, and I agree there's so many unknowns, we don't know yet um, how things will play out. So, you know, hopefully we won't use all the money and tap into those, um, tap into their surpluses um, deeply, and, and hopefully we'll have some excess that may go back to, um, to the consumers. But just a question on, um, if, and I don't know who would be over this, but on the cost of the tests where it's some hospitals are charging 150 to 200 dollars, and wondering what regulation we could get on, you know, to make sure that there's not price gouging there, and that it's really just covering, you know, what is the cost of the test, knowing there may be some offsets for being possibly underpaid by other payers, but, you know, we certainly wouldn't want hospitals to be able to charge what they want there because they know they're going to get 100% reimbursement. So. Um, don't know if you have any visibility in what you've been doing on that. Yeah, that's a, it's a fair question, and I'll just make sure I emphasize it, that those numbers I picked out were not Vermont hospitals. Those were intentionally outside of Vermont. Um, so it's something that's worth us looking at in, in, all, in all honesty and fairness, just to make sure that there isn't you know bad practices going on. But um, that hasn't been something that we've noticed to date. And, um, you know, I'm sure the health insurers could probably talk a little bit more about that and what they're seeing in terms of the claims that they're paying and the relationships that they have with the providers. But um, if there is an issue, I think um, something worth looking at. Great. Okay. Thanks. That's all I had. I thought it was a good presentation. Thank you. Tom. I'm, uh, I'm Michael. Tom Pelham here. Hi, Tom. Um, just a quick one. Um, so do you have any thoughts about how – uh, looking longer down the road, um, the current events will affect the uh, kind of actuarial, you know, trends that we use in the regulatory process. Um, I mean, is there have, have we learned from other pandemics? Is there a path that people can refer to, or is this something that's going to be uh, kind of made up when we get there? Yeah, so um, I'll answer that in a couple of ways. I mean. From, a, from previous pandemics, I did, you know, we were talking to one of our outside actuaries um, this week, and they referenced the experience that South Korea had with uh, SARS um, probably about a decade ago, and how it took them, you know, a number of years, three years to get back to a place where certain surgeries were back at the same levels prior to SARS, and whether that was due to inability to perform those surgeries for whatever reason, or capacity at the hospitals, or just a fear for people to go into the hospital. 
Um, you know, so that's something that we do want to look at is both the medium and the long-term impact of how the pandemic will change the demand and interest in medical services from consumers. Um, the other uh, thing that I think will change is this interest and reliability on telemedicine. I, I do, I mean, I don't know what your experience is and what you're hearing, but from what I hear, it seems like people that I would have suspected would be really frustrated with telemedicine have said, you know, it works pretty well, actually, and it's pretty effective for the stuff that's pretty straightforward. So I, I would imagine that the delivery of healthcare is also going to be, um, you know, something that we have to think about in the future as well, and that will have an impact as a result of this. Do you have, have another question, questions. Tom? No. Okay, Robin. Sure. Hi, Mike. How are you? Good, Robin. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, I was curious to know, um, and this may be more appropriate for the insurers, but I'll throw it out there so they can be thinking about it while uh, you decide to pass. But have in, have you thought about or talked with any of your actuaries about the impact of the claims lag in terms of the timing of from when we will – uh, be seeing some of the COVID related claims because of course typically what we do when we're doing estimates of spending here for example for the all pair model we use a six month claim lag so um, now I think a large part of the claims are uh, submitted much faster than that but I think that's something that we need to factor into our thinking when we're trying to figure out uh, when we'll actually know what the spending is. So I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. I think it, I think you're right to have it on your radar. Um, you know, no, I have no additional thoughts other than what we've already sort of talked about, which is, you, you know, it's unclear to me whether the, um, the just the demand for these hospital services is going to come back in the summer or whether it's going to come back um, at all or whether it's going to come back at, you know, 50% what it was. So um, I think that's obviously going to change the way that, that you have historically looked at the claims and the claims lag um, uh, over time. So uh, other than to have it on your radar, I mean, it's really, I think, going to be hard to, to, to give you um, solid advice. Maybe the insurance companies can do a better job. Yeah, I mean, I think this is going to be a tough rate review season this summer because uh, we're not going to have the information that we need. Um, in terms of rebates, I think um, this is more a comment. Um, as since we are going to be moving into QHP rate setting, and we're already in the midst of large group rate rate premiums for um, for the next round, I think making sure that we remain in close contact about what you might be thinking in terms of rebates because obviously we're going to need to factor that kind of information into our premium setting uh, that we're going to be doing shortly. So that's yeah, just a comment in terms of we do have that overlapping area that we're going to need to make sure we coordinate on. Um, and then uh, lastly, um, I just wanted to say to Maureen's comment um, around price gouging, um, I think that there are two other area, two other ways to, to keep track of that. One is I know the Attorney General's office has been um, thinking about and on top of looking at price gouging initiatives in all areas, but uh, we also have rate setting authority, so that could be an area if there appears to be a problem that we could start to exercise our authority. Just yeah, good point, Robin. Yeah, good point. And just I'll give I'll just give you some clarity about the the first comment that you made about the timing and, and rebates. And certainly, I think the, the department and the board um, obviously want to keep in close contact. I 100% agree with that. But if I were to give you my honest assessment from where we stand now, I mean, I I think um, we're probably looking at plan year 2022 for all of this all of the stuff that we just talked about being reconciled. I, I just don't envision us having. Um, clarity about where a number of these things will shake out until you know, basically this time next year. 
So, um, you you know, again, we should stay in close contact, but uh, I wouldn't anticipate um, our department uh, being proactive in that regard until there was a very clear sense that we weren't going to have to, you know, you don't want to have volatility in pricing. You want it to be consistent. So, um, uh, and I think that's to the benefit of consumers, both from a pricing standpoint, but also from a, um, you know, the, 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 the solvency and the reliability of their health insurer as well. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks for your presentation. Jess. Jess. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I appreciated Robin's request for uh, close communication with your office, Commissioner Pichek. I think that'll be really helpful. Uh, and I really thought your presentation was very clear and insightful. And I want to thank you for the swift and decisive action that your office did, you know, as this public health crisis came before us. I'm wondering, my first question is, are any of the temporary actions taken by your office uh, are you envisioning any of them becoming permanent post so, COVID nineteen? Yeah, good question. So the, um, you know, the 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 actions around, um, you know, most of our actions extend through the state of emergency. I'll just put it that way. So they're going to be here probably for a little while. You know, they're going to be in place for a little while. The ones related to COVID obviously will fall off once the current pandemic is is we're through that. The, the the point about um, telemedicine, you know, I, we've yeah. expanded it to audio only. Um, there is, you know, the reason I think it was not audio only to begin with is because there are concerns under HIPAA about ensuring that the doctor is actually talking to the patient, like you and I can ensure that we're talking to each other here. So when you do audio only, you know, it does ra raise the specter of, of, of elderly or other vulnerable populations getting taken advantage of and sharing important personal information in a way they um, didn't intend to. So that is a concern longer term um, on the telemedicine, uh, one component of the telemedicine that we've done. On the 30-day supply, for example, another concern is the availability of pharmaceuticals. You don't want people hoarding medicine um, if it's not necessary. So I think we will look closely at each of these um, and see what their value is or relevancy is after the COVID pandemic is complete. The one, like I said, that I think has the most, um, as I sit here today, the one that probably would most likely, um, maybe in a new form, but most likely uh, continue would be the telemedicine emergency rules, something around uh, that, because I, I do think that will continue to be of interest to Vermonters in terms of how they uh, get medical attention in the future. Yeah, I, I think that's a really important line of, you know, inquiry as we get out of this. You know, we've heard a lot about people actually liking telemedicine, having that access with their providers. And to the degree that we're a rural state and transportation barriers right. are real, you know, this could be a huge uh, silver lining in this public health crisis is increasing access through telemedicine. We need bandwidth. <laughs> and that's something also yeah, to add to sure. our agendas collectively as a state. But I think, you know, I would hope that some version of telemedicine would stay. Um, my second question is, I agree with you on the tremendous uncertainty. And I've appreciated, I've listened in on a lot of the um, press conferences in which you've been very involved with some of the projections going forward. And, uh, again, recognize that there's a lot of uncertainty. As I'm trying to think about the predictions around the impact on private insurers of treatment of COVID-19 in particular, and your data shows this, it looks like the hospitalization is where it's really expensive, um, right? 40 to 70K, you know, back of the envelope calculations around treatment. But I'm wondering, you know, you've been involved in all these uh, projections and seeing some of the evidence. It seems to me, and I don't have all the data in front of me, but the older population is the one more likely to be hospitalized. They're the ones that are going to incur these hospitalization fees. They're more likely to be under Medicare, I guess. So I'm just wondering, as we think going forward about the high cost of COVID-19 as an offset to the delayed care that the insurance providers are not, you know, uh, incurring right now, should we be thinking about who's most likely to be hospitalized and are they most likely to be insured by a private carrier versus Medicare. So I'm wondering what you, your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a, a insightful way of looking at the problem because, um, you know, not every, you know, if there were 29 people in the hospital last week, not all 29 of them are with one of the, uh, with one of the exchange plans, for example, or one of the plans that, that uh, you'll be, that one of the insurers selling today that you'll hear from, it could be other 
ways that those individuals are getting insurance. So I do think it's important to think about that, certainly. Um, we have seen, you're absolutely right, people that are between 60 and 70 and 70 and 80 and 80 plus are more susceptible to severe complications as a result of COVID-19, as are people with underlying medical conditions. Um, so it is something to be mindful of that, um, that that very well could be the case. I will mention something else that um, is unique um, that, we've, that we've experienced in Vermont that we, weren't, we hadn't heard of in the national data or elsewhere which is we expected to see a lot more hospitalizations, um, particularly to, as a result of our elderly population, but a lot, particularly as a result also of the outbreaks that had occurred um, in the nursing home facilities. But a lot of the individuals in the nursing home that ended up passing away never went to the hospital. They died in place due to um, instructions under that, under, uh, to that effect. So um, that's something else just to keep in mind is, you know, we wanna, we wanna, there's a lot of different factors here, obviously, but uh, you, you picked out an insightful one that we should be mindful of who is in the hospital, who is who is requiring treatment, uh, not just what the cost of that treatment is. Um, so something something on the modeling front, obviously, we are really interested in for different reasons, but something we're keeping our eye on closely. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the board before I open it up to the public? If not, would anybody from the public wish to offer a comment on Commissioner Pichek's testimony? Sure, hi. Um, hi, Kevin and everybody else. This is uh, Kathy Mahoney from the um, from um, from Ludlow, Vermont at the moment. Uh, and I, I just have a comment and that is around the intriguing option of a type of reimbursement, as you said, like a rebate, Kevin, for you know, what auto insurances are doing. But I, I share Mike's hesitation about timing. And the reason I do is because on the, on the clinical front, we don't really know what the medium and longer term consequences are of, of COVID-19. You know, I think we have to be careful of, of planning based on what we presently know because it evolved so quickly. Even in the younger patients who are having this disease, many of them are really debilitated when they come out. Some uh, may suffer some long-term consequences. Uh, there's a number of case reports of things like that, people with clotting issues, strokes, uh, um, amputations, and things like that. So I, I think it's a good idea, but I agree that it's too early. Uh, and if we are gonna talk about maybe some um, financial money to be set aside, Maybe that's, a, that's something that could be considered in the shorter term, but um, I think we have to wait a good six months plus to see how, how our patients do collectively. Okay, I don't think there was a question there. So in, other members of the public. Hearing none, um, I wish to thank you, Commissioner Pichek. Um, I, I am somewhat discouraged um, by one statement that you made that hospitals um, in June might be able to do uh, non-elective. And I know that everything has to be driven by the data, but as I talk to some hospitals in areas of the state that have no inpatient COVID um, Vermonters being treated, I, I would hope that the administration would be open to um, listening to plans put out through VAS or by individual hospitals that would protect people, but also give them the ability to get the type of preventative medicine that could save dollars to the system in the long run, such as colonoscopies and mammographies and, and those type of things. And the last thing we want to do is see costs skyrocket because people aren't getting adequate medical care for a prolonged period of time. So just I'll throw that and keep it in your ear. Yeah, no, it's an excellent, excellent point. I mean, as you know, as well as the board knows, early intervention results in better, better medical outcomes in, in almost every case and, and certainly better financial outcomes too. So certainly something the administration is open to and didn't mean to suggest that's the, the line in the sand just as an example of um, the timing that we might be dealing with. Super. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Have a good meeting. Thank you. So at this time, we're going to uh, move to the, the three carriers, and we're going to start with Blue Cross Blue Shield with um, 
Don George and uh, Dr. Uh, McIntosh. And basically, Don, is it just the two of you or are others going to speak as well? Or It, it will just be myself and Dr. McIntosh. Okay, great. And um, do you have control of the uh, Skype meeting so that you can share your presentation? Well, actually, if uh, Abigail's on the line, Yep. Rather than uh, risk a delay fumbling with the technology on my side, Abigail, if you could please bring up the Blue Cross presentation. I thought that worked uh, well for Commissioner Pichak. Of course. Thank you. Can everyone see that? It's loading still. Now we can. Can you see it, Don? Uh, it's still loading for me. There we go. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. The internet in Rutland must be better. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you to all the members of the Green Mountain Care Board for having us here today, and thank you to the more than 50 participants who have joined uh, today. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm Don George. I'm the president and CEO of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. I am joined today by my colleague, Dr. Kate McIntosh, who is the senior medical director in our integrated health area. Um, I'm going to begin today by sharing an overview of our response, a bit about the approach that we take, and uh, some areas of particular focus for us. Uh, I'll be followed by uh, Dr. McIntosh, um, in her sharing of uh, some of the uh, very specific programs and policy changes that we have made in response uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic in Vermont. And then uh, once uh, Dr. McIntosh concludes, I'll come back just for a moment to share some uh, closing thoughts on the challenges, unknowns uh, in the road ahead for us. Um, so Abigail, if you would, you can go to what is our slide two. It's a Blue Cross Blue Shield guiding principles. And uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, at its onset, we set down uh, the principles that would guide all of us at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. I'll just comment on some areas of focus. Uh, first and foremost, we focused on the safety and the security of Blue Cross Blue Shield employees. Um, we always feel responsible uh, for their health and well being, but particularly uh, in this crisis, uh, we understood that keeping our employees healthy uh, was an imperative so that we would be here, our operations would be uh, complete and in continuity so that we could continue to serve Vermonters who depend on us as the pandemic spread throughout Vermont. So all of our employees were home sourced in three waves over two weeks, uh, beginning in uh, the middle of March. Um, we also, at the same time we were home sourcing, we uh, communicated extensively with uh, members and customers to ensure that they were constantly apprised of news we felt they needed to know relative uh, to the pandemic and also apprised of important information about coverage changes and program flexibility changes that we we're offering to customers. And that communication is ongoing. One of uh, the, the strong principled approaches that we have taken is a commitment to sort, support providers and public health to strengthen delivery capacity. And in a moment, Dr. McIntosh is going to share um, our telehealth program that we brought up uh, very quickly uh, at the onset of the pandemic. Uh, we felt that this achieved a number of objectives we are committed to, certainly with supporting physicians and community providers to maintain uh, their cash flow, or at least part of it during this period of time. They're able to maintain their patient census. Well, it's also supporting our members to maintain continuity of care and contact with their physicians and community providers during a very uh, critical time. Um, finally, I just comment relative to our principles that we have been committed uh, to the very principle that in crisis, the speed with which we make actions uh, is as important as the quality and the meaning of those actions themselves. So that to say, above all, we have really endeavored to respond as quickly uh, as we possibly can to the program changes we've made. Um, we can go to the next slide, Abigail. 
So we're here today, uh, Dr. McIntosh and myself, and appreciate the opportunity to share some specific about specifics about Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's response. But we feel that we are part of an overall state response in which all of the individual contributors like ourselves uh, need to be in concert with others and the state to support the overall strategy and response. So that's why we have uh, supported the public health strategy in Vermont. We've done that by aligning and collaborating uh, with healthcare providers in Vermont and uh, with many areas of state government, including the Department of Health, the, the Department of Vermont Health Access, and most certainly uh, the Department of Financial Regulation. I, I certainly would agree uh, with Commissioner Pichek's representation that the stakeholder meetings that his department have coordinated have been highly collaborative, very thoughtful process. I think it has served uh, Vermonters well during this time. Uh, but within this larger framework, Blue Cross had res responded with numerous uh, program and policy changes to support members, customers, uh, the public, uh, health, and also providers. And in a moment again, Dr. McIntosh will provide some specifics on those programs. We can go to the next slide, Abigail. So I thought by way of introduction, I also would give you an image of uh, what I refer to as Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont's rapid response teams. Um, we formed a pandemic preparation team at the onset uh, of the pandemic. It was led by Dr. McIntosh, who you'll hear from in a moment. Uh, this was the team that focused on all of our pandemic response objectives and the program and policy changes that we have made. Um, we also um, were served well by our business continuity team. Uh, this is an existing team that every year um, creates and responds to mock exercises of emergencies in which uh, they need to ensure the continuity of operations and services. And certainly this was no mock exercise and they performed very well. Uh, in the first two weeks of our response through these two teams, uh, Blue Cross has adapted our technology to enable more than 400 employees to work from home. We've also ensured the continuity of our core operations. And as I alluded to, we've changed uh, numerous programs and policies to support uh, members and providers. I spoke also of uh, the importance, critical importance of communications during this period of time. So on behalf of literally thousands of um, individual customers throughout the state and more than 200,000 Vermont members, We've engaged in an extensive uh, communication campaign to keep our members uh, and providers constantly apprised of what Blue Cross Blue Shield is doing. Um, our flexible approach to premium payments that is on this slide has been among those many changes that we communicated to providers. Uh, we believe that this program recognizes that during a, a really difficult time, um, a down economy as well as a healthcare crisis for um, some of our customers we acknowledge that they're going to find it difficult to stay on their regular premium payment schedule. So for our large customers and small businesses, what we'd refer to as our group customers, we are waiving all the requirements that their employees be actively employed in order to remain on the group coverage. We're providing the flexibility, and frankly, we're encouraging them, even though they may be in a circumstance because of social distancing, and the healthcare, uh, the economy as it exists today, they may be in a position of having to furlough employees, certainly with the intent of bringing them back once we are through the crisis and the economy picks back up. Um, we're, we're encouraging them to maintain those employees on the health insurance to the extent that they're able to do that. And we're also uh, providing our small businesses and individual purchasers um, with the flexibility um, to make some, if not all, of their premium payments or an extension of time in order to make the premium payments. And as I speak to you here today, we're not experiencing any reduction uh, in our membership. So we're, we're hopeful that these things are helping. Uh, and uh, Abigail, we can go to the next slide. So <clears throat> we approach um, this crisis in Vermont uh, from two different perspectives. Uh, we're in the midst of both a health care and an economic crisis, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and our customers are being impacted uh, by both. So Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is a single state, nonprofit blue plan serving only Vermonters, uh, is committed uh, to the most expansive role that we can play to support 
uh, Vermont's response to COVID-19. Uh, Commissioner Pichak did a very nice job of uh, explaining the need for member reserves and what the reserve levels approximately are for the insurers, including Blue Cross. I would just say we have member reserves to protect Blue Cross and our customers and providers from the risk of unpaid claims and potential insolvency. And responding to pandemics uh, like COVID-19, it's just one of the reasons that we have illustrated over the last several years uh, of why it's important and why, frankly, we insist on maintaining adequate reserves to protect members and providers. And while we are by no means over-reserved, we do feel, we would agree with Commissioner Pichek, we do feel prepared to see Vermonters through this crisis. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we are mindful of both the magnitude of the potential impact and the duration of both the health care crisis and the economic downturn. So with that, I would say that we are also mindful that there is absolutely nothing in our history by which we can measure how this uh, crisis will test us or test our financial resolve. And I would imagine that the same uh, could be said uh, on behalf or by every provider and stakeholder in the Vermont health care system. So Abigail, you can change the slide again. Thank you. And um, so that uh, is uh, the introduction. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. McIntosh, and I'll be back with you in a few minutes. Thank you very much. I want to make sure, am I coming through clearly? I can yes. hear you fine. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Could I have the next slide, please? So thank you for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Blue Cross to try to help. We tried to move very quickly when this became evident that it was coming our way. And I think it's fair to say that under the guidance of DFR and in concert with the other uh, plans in Vermont, including um, Medicaid and the other private insurers, Vermont has rolled out one of the most generous telehealth programs that is available around the country and very aggressively. And our goal was to be able to allow providers to replace office visits with telehealth. This, the hope of this was that we, we would support providers to maintain their cash flow and their patient census. And there have been dramatic drops in the number of office visits around the state. But we have seen a high variability in the actual drop among our different types of provider. But we have providers who have successfully made an impressive switch to telehealth and are able to maintain their capacity. Not at 100%, but they're doing okay. We have others who are not. So I think we have to be sensitive that there's a wide variation across, across providers. Um, we wanted to support patients with continuity of care, and we also wanted to protect providers and patients from in-person contact. And this is really important because we wanted to be able to preserve the PPE and the other equipment for the hospitals where it really needed to be used. We also wanted to keep people out of the emergency room and out of urgent care if possible so that we could preserve the emergency room for those waves. And the thing about this telehealth approach is that because it is flexible, it will serve us well should we get a second or even a third wave of, of COVID-19. I, I think that the, consens the census is pretty clear across physicians that we are going to get additional waves of this. We don't know how bad they're going to be, but we know that they will come. The question is not if, the question is, is when. Um, in addition, because of the connectivity issues that Dr. Holmes mentioned, um, we do have big issues with connectivity around the state, and we knew that would be a barrier to telemedicine. So what we did was we turned on codes so that audio-only telephone could be used rather than audio-visual telemedicine for some types of visits. This is not without risks in terms of quality, but we felt that it was important to be able to do this increased access. And finally, we turned on store and forward payment payment in our permanent telemedicine policy. This will not be, this is not emergency turn on that. We've turned it on across the board. It's, it's ready to go. Could I have the next slide, please? We also expanded our existing telemedicine policy, as I said, to include outpatient visits that went to telephone only. We expanded existing mental health counseling options, very specifically adding crisis intervention, intensive outpatient treatment, and all of the existing mental health counseling options, which were already very expansive. We added preventive care and behavioral health screenings, including new patients, 
to the to our telemedicine policy. We also permanently added some elements of physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy to our permanent telemedicine policy because we also believe that the future of telemedicine um, is that it is really here to stay. But we also then expanded additional measures for physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists. Could I have the next slide, please? All of these temporary and permanent changes will be looked at at the end of the emergency period. We do not plan to remove anything from our permanent policy, but we may find that there are elements of our temporary policy that we would like to move onto the permanent policy and maintain. We also instituted a telephone triage payment at zero cost share to members to try to support providers who are managing a dramatic increase in the number of calls that they're receiving to their offices. Previously, this has not been a billable code. We did institute this emergency policy to try to support the need for nurses and other triage individuals to be answering the phones. We also added limited applied behavioral analysis and we expanded codes to meet the other needs of, of autistic children because one of the problems of schools closing is that kids with special needs are not receiving some of the services that they need. So to be able to provide those services over the phone, some of them we have we added to the permanent policy, some of them we added to the emergency policy. We also, to our permanent policy, added lactation con consultation over the phone, and we also authorized the home health agencies to perform some limited follow-up that they felt was medically capable or medically appropriate to have allow them to do it either over phone or telemedicine. And we're continuing to look at what our other areas are that we might need to expand out to. Could I have the next slide, please? So this gives you some sense of the evolving expansion. And I will tell you, this slide, I did this slide two weeks ago, and I can update these numbers for you. So these are, this is the difference. The little tiny blue dots are what happened are the amount of telemedicine that we had March and April of 2017. And the red bars are telehealth claims visits and dollars paid in, 20, in 2020. So, so 2019 to 2020, there is a dramatic change in the amount of telehealth that is happening. And these numbers have been revised upward yet again. As of uh, 427, we have had a total of 36,698 claims, of which 18,400 were mental health, 16,700 were office visits, and we have paid in total just in March and April of 2020 so far $3.3 million in telehealth claims. So our providers have pivoted rapidly. It is dramatic, the work that they have done, and they are taking advantage of this to try to help both of, both their practices and their patients weather this storm. Next slide, please. So we have also waived member cost share in our uh, benefit expansion for, as, as, my, as, our, as Mr. Pichek talked about, all uh, COVID-19 testing related to office visits, providers via telemedicine, urgent care, or ER, so not just the testing, but the office visits, uh, COVID-19 inpatient and acute outpatient treatment, um, which is both complicated and costly, but um, we are working very hard on implementing that. Non-urgent ambulance transport for COVID-19 patients who require isolation. This is very important when you leave the hospital with COVID-19. You can't necessarily get in the car with people who aren't infected. So it's important to be able to transport people from one place to the other in a way that allows individuals to stay isolated. We have also waived cost share for acute uh, telemedicine visits through the vendor, especially at the request of some of our ASOs. We've talked about the telephone triage, and we've complied with all of the federal state bullets and the rules and all the other changes that have come through to make sure that, that um, we are trying to meet the needs of our members in this time. Can I have the next slide, please? And so the goal of all of these temporary waivers has been to try to facilitate necessary patient care, ease the administration for providers, We've allowed the early prescription refills that DFR um, mentioned, allowing longer supplies of essential medicines. We've tried to manage drug shortages. We've tried to manage off-label prescribing and hoarding. And we've also tried to facilitate member access to brand and specialty pharmaceuticals where possible. We have also waived some prior authorizations and prior notifications, and we are extending imaging authorizations out 180 days. And also we are evaluating uh, procedures that were deferred as a result of um, 
of the epidemic, and we will be we will be pushing those out as well, so that um, so that members are not finding that their authorizations have expired. Um, the we have been able to because, as we've talked about, there have been fewer uh, non-essential procedures. Um, we are not finding that our members as are as highly impacted by by these as we thought they might be. So that's that's a good thing. But we're waiting to see what happens as the hospitals begin to bring services back online, um, hopefully soon. Could I have the next slide, please? And finally, provider support. Uh, we are very concerned about financial stability. We have devised a hospital advanced payment program and are in active conversation with the hospitals. We have also devised an independent and community provider revenue stabilization program and are working with our independent and community providers as, as they need uh, to try to help them stabilize their revenue as we go through this. We have also been in close contact with OneCare to help them revise their programs. Providers are busy. Uh, they have other things on their mind. A lot of these programs are not going to be in 2020 what uh, we thought they were going to be. So we have restructured the 2020 quality program to remove provider financial commitment, and OneCare is funneling those funds directly to practices. We're working to restructure our risk agreement to adjust for the COVID impact, and we made a prospective payment program available to all the hospitals in the OneCare network. We are also continuing our blueprint payments and we have suspended any recoveries that might have been in play. Next slide, please. Finally, we have discontinued these routine audits in accordance with the DFR bulletin, suspended uh, pharmacy audits. We are, however, watching closely for price gouging and for fraud because this is an area of big concern, especially uh, with the COVID-19 testing and a lot of the suspension of in-network and out-of-network. There are areas of risk there, so we're trying to keep a close eye on that. We have streamlined our credentialing process to facilitate payments to traveling providers and to also a work with people who are working across state lines. And then we have done a series of education sessions with our new and revised telemedicine and telephone policies, uh, speaking to by state through VPQHC and VCHIP, and also trying to have robust communications on the provider portal and with provider associations so that everyone is up to date on the changes because things are changing very quickly. And then we've also created rapid reference specialty specific bulletins to help individual groups figure out how what they can, can and cannot do on telemedicine and how to build that. And we are continuing to do rapid claims processing and payments. Next slide, please. And finally, we have been working with DIVA and with the health department to try to support a cohesive response around surveillance and testing. We want to support whatever it is that they have that they choose to do and to try to make sure that we bring our cooperation fully to that. We also are encouraging our self-funded employers to adopt DFR policy and regulatory changes with regard to COVID-19 health coverage. And we are really pleased that we've had wide buy-in of the DFR policies. Um, we are also providing and extending our COVID-19 special enrollment period for the uninsured and providing and analyzing these COVID-19 data and results and giving those to uh, DFR and working with DIVA to see, make sure that we are all working in concert. Next slide, please. So I will turn it back over to Don George. Okay, thank you, Dr. McIntosh, and uh, Abigail, you can go to uh, the, what is slide 17? So, um, we've heard a lot uh, about how the assumptions about um, the road ahead for us continue just to be the subject of debate and, and speculation. Uh, and when it comes to trying to rely on financial impact assumptions and projections, I think that Dr. Anthony Fauci said it best. Uh, when Dr. Fauci stated, and I'm, I'm quoting him now, I just don't think we really need to make a projection when it's such a moving target that you could so easily be wrong. So I, I really do agree uh, with Dr. Fauci. Um, we can do projections, uh, but the future is going to be very difficult to project, probably right out through to 2022. But I would say that we do see some areas um, of uncertainty and new costs that are emerging. I have listed, listed them here under significant claims, uncertainty, and new costs. And I'll just 
um, comment on each of them lightly. Uh, certainly, uh, we heard from Commissioner Pichek about temporary cancellation and non-essential services. Uh, heard from Chair Mullen about uh, how hospitals, what their experience is now. Uh, certainly, Blue Cross Blue Shield is now, even with a claims lag, beginning to experience this. I do know there's interest uh, from some of the board members about what Blue Cross's experience is, so I came prepared to share it today. Uh, we, our actuaries, have developed a model that smooths out really what are the normal ups and downs or fluctuations that we would see uh, in a week-to-week -week or even month-to-month -month, uh, claims uh, submission and um, have uh, created a model in which we feel like we're able to identify at least a range of a decline in, uh, in claims that is attributable to COVID-19. So I'll give it to you in three categories. Uh, for Vermont facilities, Vermont hospitals, um, we are experiencing, this is as of last week, a 40 to 60 percent uh, reduction in what we normally would see and we, that we would attribute to COVID-19. Um, from professional providers in Vermont, we're experiencing a 20 percent to 33 percent reduction that we would attribute to COVID-19 less than the Vermont hospitals, um, and so we would attribute at least some of that to uh, or the early intervention with the telehealth program. For prescription drugs, actually a quite different uh, experience. We're seeing a 7% to 17% increase um, in scripts being written that we would attribute to COVID-19, and we would attribute this uh, quite likely to the change of policy that we have allowing up to 180-day supply. Um, so the second uh, bullet that I've listed here, of course, is COVID-19 diagnosis and treatment, and for what unknown duration. Certainly, we've heard a lot uh, from Commissioner Pichek about this issue. Um, really, uh, the unknowns become how much and what type of care will uh, need to be provided, um, what will be the infection rate. Um, we, we did have a good question, good question of Commissioner Pichak about, um, you know, certainly the, those are the most vulnerable in our population are older. Uh, they would not tend to be in a commercial population. Uh, by the same token, we are uh, receiving reports of those uh, who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s um, contracting COVID-19 and um, not being quite as vulnerable as our older population. They're able to recover. Uh, but we are seeing some very long intensive care unit hospital stays related uh, to those people who are in middle age um, but um, contract the virus and are therefore recovering, uh, but uh, recovering at the expense of a very long ICU stay. Um, this next bullet point about a portion of delay care returning is one that I am concerned about and I really think bears watching, and that is um, we have a some cancellation and delay of non-essential services. So we think a portion, not all, but some of that delayed care will return. But also in the aftermath of COVID-19, uh, you know, will we experience um, a decline, a general decline in the health status of at least, I would say, the Blue Cross Blue Shield members that's related to delayed care and the isolation of social distancing? Uh, so I think the question here really becomes, you know, how much and what type of care is going to be delayed, and of course for how long, uh, but also at what consequence. So there is this interplay between the delay of care and ultimately the health status that we emerge uh, from COVID-19 with, and we could be left uh, with um, a deteriorated health status that would uh, exert an in, in, in overlay onto our health care system a cost, which we are currently not experiencing today. Um, certainly, the future uh, COVID-19 treatments and other costs remains an unknown. And then, um, of course, there's a, a generally a month uh, uh, health uh, care and public health professionals. Uh, there is acceptance that we will have a second wave or perhaps even a third wave of COVID-19 in the fall or even in the spring next year or even the potential that this could become endemic. Um, so we need to be prepared for that. In consideration of this all, I, I would say that uh, we believe at Blue Cross that claims uncertainty will persist for the weeks and the months ahead, uh, and the uncertainty will likely come in waves and in waves of unknown duration. Uh, certainly, it will be difficult to get a picture 
of what these true costs are going to be uh, until beyond 2021. All of that said, um, in the end, there has been discussion today and questions about insurers receiving a financial windfall. We're certainly not operating from the perspective uh, that there will be winners or losers, um, or that somehow we will end up um, with a windfall from this. Um, but to be sure, uh, this is not about winners and losers. So in the end, if Blue Cross Blue Shield does receive a financial windfall, as always, this money will be used to mitigate future rate increases. I think that that is a well-established, well-known, well-worn path for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, so please be assured. Uh, Abigail, you can move to the final slide. Thank you. So I just wanted to touch here on um, what the future uh, holds for us in terms of our current and, and reformed healthcare system. And, and while the duration of both this healthcare and economic crisis is unknown, I do think it's important for all of us to learn as we go through this experience of um, the, the really dire circumstances in front of us. I think it's important even today to reflect on what areas of our current response will become permanent changes. I appreciate the questions that have been asked about that. So uh, you heard uh, Dr. McIntosh say that from Blue Cross's perspective, we certainly think some aspects of telehealth uh, will continue in the future. Um, we have seen all of our healthcare providers um, who have, are struggling uh, with the, the lack of uh, revenue that has occurred. I hope that uh, this crisis, if nothing else, will give us the opportunity to put fee-for-service reimbursement in our rearview mirror of healthcare reform and uh, adopt global payments uh, that will provide a consistent stream of revenue during normal times and during times of crisis for our healthcare providers. And then finally, I would say that uh, we should be thinking now even about how do we carry forward all of this learning to reshape the healthcare system uh, to not only be ready for the next pandemic, but also provide Vermonters uh, the health care that they need and deserve in that an affordable cost. So a uh, thank you all for listening, and uh, Dr. McIntosh and I would be happy to take questions. Great. Thank you, Don. Uh, Member Usper. Uh, I'm good. It was a really clear presentation. I think we'll – you know, it really is kind of a wait and see to what happens, and we can all kind of predict what we, what we hope will happen, but I, I think it's something we will wait and see, and I agree that in the past, um, things are given back to the ratepayers or adjustments made if there were big additions to what would be the surplus. So, Member Pelham. I have one question. I mean, I have the same ob observation that Maureen does and most everyone does. Is this, we're all going to have to remain quite agile in the months and years ahead as we kind of pull out of this. One uh, insight that I would ask of Don and his team is, are there any insights that you have in terms of, of uh, during this pandemic, how you've engaged with independent providers and specialists versus those who are aligned with uh, hospitals is it uh, you know I mean, uh, has it been smooth on both fronts or are there uh, distinct uh, differences between the two well I, I would say that um, we generally do not approach um, our physicians whether they be employed by facilities or independent differently we are certainly accessible to both um, I, I do know that Dr. McIntosh did a great deal of outreach working with community physicians on, um, you know, what specific codes they needed in the development of the telehealth program. Uh, we have developed, um, as Dr. McIntosh cited, we've worked with community providers to develop a specific um, claims advance program support system for them, and we are talking to a number of them uh, about accessing that. Um, so I, I would also defer uh, Dr. McIntosh to you as to whether or not you have experiences, differences uh, in, on this, this question. I think that there's no question at this time that um, independent providers are feeling very vulnerable. And I say that because I ran a practice for 16 years before I came to Blue Cross and, and I am in uh, really frequent contact with the pediatrician because that's my area, but also with 
uh, by and some of the other larger groups. And I think that there's a vulnerability, especially among independent mental health providers and also independent practices because they don't have necessarily the reserves and the cushion. But we have done a lot of extra education and support of explaining uh, telehealth and how to um, under, you know, how to uh, take that out, how to make it work in practice. And then also creativity. I think pediatricians have been thinking uh, real issues because they need to back the kids in a time when they're scared and practices are uncertain. And they have been amazed in their um, ability to step up and really come up with creative solutions to work with, to try to figure out how to vaccinate kids and how to engage who really do need to be seen in person if possible at this time. And so I'm incredibly impressed by the activity and the um, the willingness to try out things that we might never have considered that I'm seeing in the independent writers, I do think there is that additional sense of insecurity as a result of not having a large participation at your back. Thank you. Member Lunge. Thank you. Um, I don't really have any questions. I felt like, um, the data provided really answered a lot of the questions that I was prepared to ask about. Um, just one comment on the telehealth um, expansion and kind of where do we go from here is I do hope that when you are thinking about uh, down the road changes to be made permanent versus temporary, um, that you keep in mind uh, the broadband issues in terms of um, the more rural areas of our state and how phone access, um, while certainly there are many types of services that it would not be appropriate for, um, but where clinically appropriate, having that availability for low-income people in rural areas in particular will really be an access expansion that would be needed, quite frankly, with or without COVID-19. So just a comment. But I hope you uh, keep that population in particular in mind when you're thinking through uh, what makes sense uh, to continue. That's such a good point. Uh, we, we will absolutely keep that in mind. Thank you. Okay, Member Holmes. Okay, great. Thank you. So I want to say, first of all, a very clear presentation, and I appreciated all of Blue Cross Blue Shield's uh, responsiveness on so many levels, from delivery reform, to, you know, in terms of expanding telehealth to payment adjustments in terms of advanced payment to hospitals. So really helpful. And I agree on the uh, permanent changes to telehealth and the importance of fixed payments and alternative payment models. So hoping this opens up a new dialogue as we come out of this for what our future looks like. And I'm, I'm enthusiastic to hear that you know, in some ways, some of the learnings uh, that we're seeing, you're also agreeing with. My quick question is, uh, last week I was listening to uh, Addie Stramolo's uh, testimony to the Joint uh, Senate Health and House Health Committees, and what she testified to was that she saw there was a, uh, an increase in Medicaid enrollment in March, April, of about 5,000 households and a very small increase of about 237 households on the QHP through the expanded enrollment period. And I'm wondering if you could just update us on your enrollment changes, what you're seeing. Are you seeing uh, a loss of members moving towards Medicaid uh, from your subscriber list? Uh, good question. Uh, thank you. So on the um, commercial side, we have been tracking membership um, by the week uh, and reporting it since the, uh, the onset of the pandemic. And we are down less than 500 members um, out of more than 200,000. So uh, these could have been large group customers um, who furloughed people and chose not to keep them on their health insurance. Uh, we're seeing a very little decline uh, in the QHP population, I would say we're seeing relatively little uptake in the open enrollment period, which seems unfortunate. My understanding is that there is about 250 overall. Um, so, I, you know, I think that we are our proportional share within that. So, no, we're not seeing membership declines right through to this week. Okay, great. Thank you. 
Okay, at this time I'm going to open it up to the public for any public comment. Hearing none, I wish to uh, thank Dr. McIntosh and, and uh, Don for an excellent presentation. And we're going to um, now move on to MVP with uh, Dr. Kim Kilby and Richard Odorizzi. And um, do you wish to control the uh, slides or do you wish to continue in this format with Abigail controlling them? So we don't have a formal deck. I did provide a web address in your agenda that you can refer to for the details, and I'll just be speaking as well as Rich. Okay, great. So thank you. Um, I wanted to just introduce myself, Dr. Kim Kilby. I'm a family and preventive medicine physician. I completed my family medicine residency at UVM. And currently, I serve as the senior leader for the regional medical director team at MVP, and my coverage area is uh, Capital District, New York, and Vermont. Um, I also just want to mention that about 10 years ago, I led the New York State Department of Health uh, EPI in surveillance response to H1N1 because I was the director of communicable disease control. So this all feels very familiar and uh, certainly happy to be here and give you an update. And thank you for, for the opportunity to share with the Green Mountain Care Board the efforts MVP has made in our clinical response to COVID-19. After my portion, I will turn the, the stage over to Rich Odorizzi to be able to give the financial update. MVP Healthcare is a regional health plan with membership of 700,000 across New York State and Vermont with 39,000 members in Vermont. As many of you are aware, New York State was one of the earliest areas affected, and as such, we feel at MVP we have been aggressive and extremely proactive in our response to the pandemic from its earliest days, which has led us to be quite well positioned for the decisions that later came from Vermont DFR, as much of what was ultimately placed into regulation in Vermont we had already implemented across our network. Although I will share in detail the clinical changes we have made, I also want to bring your attention to the website, which is in your agenda, and gives a detailed summary of all the changes we have made in response to COVID-19 to date, that's specifically for providers, and gives that detailed coding guidance. That's part of the reason I didn't want to codify things in slides is because it continues to evolve, and we want to make sure people have the most, the most accurate information at all times. The MVP website also contains detailed information for our members, which we have been posting regular updates to, as well as posts on social media. And that website is uh, www.mvphealthcare.com slash COVID-19. And we certainly want to make sure that our members have access to the information we are promulgating. Since the beginning of our pandemic response, the MVP approach has been threefold. The first is to maintain seamless access to all needed care for our members. The second is to support our business continuity, safety of our employees, while also maintaining an optimal level of service and access to health insurance functions for our members and providers. And the third is to support providers in their ability to provide care to their patients, our members. I'm pleased to highlight some of these recent changes for you. One of the earliest adjustments we made is to ensure that COVID-19 screening and testing would be free for patients by waiving any out-of-pocket cost. The cost share was waived also for emergency room visits or visits to an in-network healthcare provider for the purpose of getting or for determining uh, if testing was needed or getting tested, as well as drive-through specimen collection sites, which were fairly um, prevalent in New York State. As well, MVP made the business decision very early on to waive cost share for all telemedicine services, regardless of the telemedicine service connection to COVID evaluation. We supported primary care physicians and other physicians and providers in our network to be able to provide their own telemedicine services. Those services are also covered in full. Um, telephone only visits were allowed initially for mental health providers given the nature of the care they provide. And in addition, effective March 13th, 2020 in Vermont, physical health providers were also included for coverage of the telephone or audio only visits. Medicare and CMS continue to requ require the use of, of specific telephone codes for Medicare members, so that stays in effect for us. 
for our Medicare membership. We have communicated with Vermont doctors and providers about the relaxation of telehealth restrictions, including that during the state of emergency, existing patient relationship is not required. HIPAA remains paramount, but non-HIPAA compliant, non-public facing platforms such as Apple FaceTime and others are allowed. The rates are being paid as the same as in-person visits based on the provider's agreement with MVP. Services can be provided at any state as long as the member is active and provider is participating with MVP. Physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, and certified athletic trainers may render telemedicine services to MVP commercial members. We also quickly stood up a virtual emergency room telemedicine service called My ER Now. It is powered by United Concierge Medicine that allows MVP members to connect 24 seven with trained emergency medicine providers from the comfort of their home. We have been directing our members who have symptoms of COVID-19 to use this service first to help ensure people can remain safely in their home, as well as to, pre to prevent the unnecessary surge on the Vermont healthcare system. We continue and all of that is at no cost share as well. We continue to provide My Visit Now, which is a telemedicine platform we've had for quite some time, to our membership, and that provides access to a national network, um, the online care group for urgent care services, behavioral health and psychiatric services, nutrition and lactation consultation needs. We have been encouraging that avenue for our members at low risk for COVID and who have other urgent care type of needs, again, to try to reduce the burden uh, and the surge on the healthcare system. Regarding treatment for COVID-19, effective March 13th, 2020 through May 31st, 2020, MVP will waive the member cost share for the treatment of COVID-19 at any site of service, including inpatient hospitalizations and emergency room visits. Regarding prior authorization, effective for 90 days that began on March 20th, we suspended prior authorization requirements for all lines of business for inpatient surgery, inpatient admissions to any hospital, post-acute services after discharge from any inpatient stay to skilled nursing and rehab rehabilitation centers, all radiation therapy and high-tech radiology, including MRIs, MRAs, CTs, nuclear cardiology and PET scans, and also all of the interventional musculoskeletal uh, surgical prior off that was previously being done. MVP also modified the admission requirements for inpatient mental health, mental health residential, inpatient substance use detoxification, inpatient substance use rehabilitation, and substance use residential for 90 days. And we had also previously removed partial hospitalization and continued day treatment from our prior authorization um, process. That, that is permanent and that was effective March 17th. Effective March 13th, ambulance transport related to COVID uh, will be paid at no cost share for Vermont commercial members. Related to pharmacy, MVP members in a commercial plan can obtain an early refill of at least a 30-day supply of maintenance medications at an in-network pharmacy. If benefit allows, the medications that are taken on a regular basis are also available by mail order, and we've been strongly encouraging that. As well, for controlled substances and specialty medications, our members' needs are being met on a case-by-case -case basis to support whatever ongoing need they may have. And we also extended existing medication prior authorizations that we had in the system for an additional 60 days. Lastly, I would like the Green Mountain Care Board to be aware that MVP began a member outreach campaign on March 26. Our care management, health promotion, and other MVP nurse teams were trained on psychological first aid response and commenced outreach calls targeting populations most at risk, which included all of our Medicare membership all of our members deemed medically fragile, anyone utilizing adult day health services, anyone receiving private duty nursing or home care within the last six months, anyone with the use of a ventilator, trach, or oxy home oxygen therapy, and all of our members in our transplant program. 
We are also now added to that list um, outreach to known positive COVID cases. That resulted in a list of greater than 60,000 members that met that criteria and the calls continue and have helped to determine and resolve unmet needs among our membership. In conclusion, with the federal and state regulatory changes continuing to come, we would like to make sure that everyone is uh, referred to the website as uh, that's the source of the most updated information on coverage, status, and coding. And that's the mvphealthcare.com slash providers slash COVID-19. I will now turn MVP's presentation over to Rich Odorizzi for the financial updates. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Kilby. Uh, let's see if I can. Um, so yeah, so um, MVP's been really on the front lines here since since uh, middle of February with the outbreaks in New Rochelle, New York. Uh, we have a large population down there, so we've really been thinking about this and planning for this for 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 a few months now. Uh, we quickly uh, moved to a work from home. Uh, that's to help. Uh, our, our members and our providers by us not having to shut down our offices and disrupt our, our, our performance to those members. Uh, currently, we're at about 95 to 97% work from home. We have about 1,800 employees overall uh, based in Vermont and New York, and over 1,700 of those are working from home at this point. Uh, and we'll continue to work from home uh, as we continue to help flatten the curve. Um, as far as items directly impacting members, uh, we worked directly with Vermont and relaxed our grace period rules. We're up to a minimum of 60 days of grace period uh, for all groups and individuals. Um, we uh, terminate, we, we uh, held off on any terminations from March 31st that were due, uh, and, and in fact had, had only one termination uh, for somebody, for one very small group that owed for January, February, and March, and that termination didn't happen until uh, last week after continuous outreach with the group. Um, we continue to have major outreach with all of our groups, small groups, and are working with the state of Vermont uh, for help in outreach to individuals to ensure that everybody has an opportunity uh, to figure out how to make a payment or extend a payment. Um, the other the other thing that we did uh, with our with our groups was to open it up uh, to allow them alternative payment uh, methodologies, including credit cards. Uh, MVP is fully absorbing the credit card costs uh, if that is the way that a group can pay. Uh, from a claims perspective, uh, our, our claims operation teams have been working diligently to bring down any claims inventory we have. Uh, we actually had a uh, an overtime bonus program uh, in the middle of March uh, where, where we had employees work uh, Saturday and Sundays uh, to get all of our claims inventory down. We had a 35% reduction in claims, our daily claims uh, averages uh, brought down by about 35% that allowed us to speed up payments to, to our providers and our facilities. Uh, cur currently, all clean claims that come in uh, don't have to be worked by a claims representative are paid in roughly a five, five to six day average. Um, and we've also had major outreach to providers to uh, let them know that we have uh, electronic payment processes uh, through one of our national vendors uh, that allows them to have an EFT payment and, and money put directly into their bank accounts rather than having a check sent to them. That's allowing them to get money into their bank accounts uh, two to five days earlier than normal. Um, and, and, and finally, we, we really helped work um, closely on the, the full outreach uh, to all of the, the members um, within Vermont, um, really trying to be as flexible as possible uh, and, and understand whether they've uh, hopefully been able to get a PPP loan uh, for small businesses uh, and, and as flexible as possible in, in us uh, with, with premiums. Um, as far as financial impacts, uh, we have had several different areas. I'll just quickly go to them. And, and this is very similar to, to what you just heard from, from the Blues. I think uh, our, our populations are very similar. Uh, we did see a, a, a spike in pharmacy in the month of March um, that was due to those early scripts that were people that were able to renew, and we have seen a, a major increase in the 90-day supply, which we have been encouraging. 
the, the impacts to the uh, cost share uh, for COVID, had, had, we have seen those as an increase. Uh, as mentioned earlier by um, Mr. Pichak, uh, we have had seen impacts on our financials uh, investments. Uh, although there has been a rebound in, in April, uh, we have a very conservative policy uh, on investments, but uh, certainly have seen some impacts there. Uh, we have seen impacts uh, negatively on, on the, the use of credit cards. So, so those groups that uh, were not able to pay uh, cash, but were able to pay based on a credit card, uh, we have uh, taken taken those and, and we're, we're paying the full cost of that credit card usage. Um, the other impacts that we're looking at uh, on a negative impact is, is the, the grace periods uh, premiums. Uh, we have seen a dramatic slowdown in, in cash coming in the door for payment of premiums, uh, anywhere from a 20 to 25 percent decrease uh, in payments, uh, mostly over the last two and a half weeks. Uh, we're, we're, we're monitoring that on a daily basis. Uh, on, on a positive side, yes, we, we are seeing that the slowdown uh, and pretty pretty similar to to the blues um, of of cases, uh, claims coming in the door, as well as payments uh, to the providers going going out, uh, anywhere from a 20 to 25 percent decrease in total dollars out the door. Uh, that's uh, matching up with uh, with our premiums, which are deferred until uh, June in mo in many cases. Um, that's that's our biggest concern right now on a negative impact side. Uh, in addition to the unknowns of, of how much the COVID is actually going to cost and what the future cost of COVID is going to be, uh, is the potential for the premiums from the small groups that are not going to be able to survive uh, and not going to be able to get the federal loans that, that they desperately need uh, and may ultimately go out of business uh, and, and the membership um, may have to be uh, decreased. Um, like the Blues, we are seeing very little membership uh, reduction at this point in time. Uh, we have seen a slight tick up in the open enrollment period for individuals, um, but it's really too early to tell what the membership impact is going to be. I, I really have a, a fear that uh, May and, and June is going to be a telling tale for, for the membership in which which groups are able to survive this, uh, hopefully what's a short-term um, uh, business shutdown, but uh, it, it could go on longer. Um, the other item that we wanted to mention is we, we also um, are part of, uh, in, in conjunction with OneCare, uh, where, where if uh, there is uh, savings uh, over the, the course of 2020, uh, OneCare will get uh, their portion of that, that cost savings uh, returned back to them. Um, and and that's, that's, that's what we had, uh, folks. Um, from our perspective, uh, thank you, Dr. Kilby, again for for uh, your comments. Uh, we've been at this what feels like a very long time. Um, working from home for all of us is is been a challenge. Uh, I've uh, felt like I've gone to work every day for the last 35 years, and and that never had a day where I work from home. So having to learn new new tricks uh, is is a challenge, but. Uh, our uh, employees are, are very much up to the task uh, of supporting all of our Vermont members uh, and all of our providers, which are just as important. So uh, with, with that, uh, Mr. Mullins, I can turn it back over to you. When you figure out how to keep ourselves away from the refrigerator, could you let the rest of us know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I knew that one. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation. Uh, board members, uh, Maureen. Uh, thanks. Uh, just thank you very much for the presentation. This really has been very informative to let us all know what's going on and how you are handling it. So I don't have any questions. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, time was going to tell what's going to happen with all this. But thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, Kilby, near the end of your presentation, you, um, I think, said, that you had a kind of an affirmative outreach program to all of your membership that you thought was vulnerable, uh, basically kind of a check-in to see how they were doing. And so I'm wondering what, how many people in Vermont, or do you know how many people in your Vermont portfolio, you know, that you were in touch with and uh, 
what what did you learn from, learn from those folks? I will definitely follow up on that. I don't have Vermont specific data. We are we are collecting and tracking um, the engagement and the outcome of those calls and any uh, needs. So I will certainly find out if there's anything that's standing out for Vermont. I will say we have a fairly large Medicaid membership. So obviously in New York, that, that tends to overlap with the types of criteria that I named. How, however, uh, obviously our Medicare membership in Vermont is, is there as well. So I will follow up on that. Thank you. Okay, Robin. Sure. Um, I was curious to know if you're seeing your, um, whether you're seeing sort of across both states similar trends, if you're breaking that down between Vermont and New, New York. Um, in particular, um, you had talked about the 20 to 25 percent slowdown in premium payments. Um, due to the challenges for small employers. I'm wondering if that's similar in both New York and Vermont or if the, you know, New York is really skewing that percentage from our perspective. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. We, we don't have it broken down that way yet. We're actually um, developing additional uh, reports now to, to be able to break that down. I do not have a breakdown of that at this point. Thank you. Um, and can you remind me what your Medicare uh, membership is in Vermont? Um, if you yeah, don't have it off the top of your head, that's okay. Uh, 38 to 3,900 members, almost just under 4,000. Great. Um, great. I think that's all the, the – well, I guess my one other question is I don't recall if you have a significant self-insured population in Vermont or not. Um, we we have a, a self-insured population. I, I don't. I'll be honest with you. It's it's a handful of groups. Uh, I don't know the total number of members uh, of those ASO uh, uh, ERISA plans. Great. Um, so in general, over both states, I'm curious to know if you're seeing some of the self-insured employers adopting some of the same policy changes that states have been requiring ins the insured groups to. Yeah, Dr. Kilby, do you want to take first crack at that? Sure. I, I think certainly I, I do um, clinical support for the sales team and the ASO groups. And from very early on, I said we need to be strongly advocating for the same level of coverage as much as possible that these employer groups do adopt what is being recommend recommended first just to avoid member confusion and provider confusion because it can get very, very muddy very quickly. So we have certainly gone out with that message. I think from a regulatory standpoint, we have to allow them to, to make that choice and yeah. we have to go through a process, but um, we've seen very little uh, non-adoption. Uh, and I, we can follow up on Vermont ASO groups as in their level of non-adoption, but it, any um, thing that I've heard of has been related to employer groups in New York State. Okay, thank you. That's all the questions I had. Thanks so much for the presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jess. Great, thank you, and thank you again for the presentation. Really informative, really helpful. Appreciate the responsiveness of MVP. Uh, I just have a quick follow-up question uh, from Mr. Odorisi, which is around the breakout. And I think this is somewhat around Robin's question about breaking out Vermont. But I'm wondering if you can further break out. From Blue Cross Blue Shield, we heard that the medical claims were down about 40 to 60 percent for the hospitals and 20 to 33 percent for professional services. And I, you may not have that data with you now, and I totally understand that. If it's possible to follow up with us for Vermont only, the breakdown between hospital and professional services and what you're seeing in your claims experience. Yes, uh, we'll, we'll have to follow up with that. I, that I do not have uh, here, but uh, we'll follow up with our operations departments to get to get a breakdown. Absolutely. Great, thank you. That's no problem. Great. So at this time, I'm going to open it up to the public for any public comment about MVP's presentation. Is there any member of the public who wishes to offer a comment? Hi, this is... Mort Wasserman, I have a question for Dr. Kilby. So, uh, Go ahead, Mort. You're offering a couple of telehealth services to your members that don't actually go through their primary care practitioners. 
How do you assure a continuity of care in those instances? So we have a couple of mechanisms in which we're assuring that. One thing I would point out is that the services that predominate in those two virtual environments that were, one of them was previously part of our portfolio and the other one was recently added, are for urgent care and or emergency room needs. And so those would function just like you would if you walked into an emergency room or an urgent care center and that you would receive your services and then that communication would be provided to your primary care physician if you in enrollment stated who your primary care physician is and that you would like that, that information communicated. So very similarly, the same thing is happening in the virtual environments. And then also uh, for the virtual ER, um, well, I guess that answers that. So essentially, it's incumbent upon making sure you disclose who your primary care physician is, and that way that, that um, documentation of that visit and the disposition of that visit can be provided to your primary care for continuity of care purposes. And do you have any way to measure to what extent the telehealth services actually uh, try to elicit that information and then actually get it through to primary care practitioners? I say this because that's a major stumbling block here if it falls through the crack and the primary care doctor, uh, she doesn't know actually what has happened with her patient. Sure, um, and as a primary care physician, I completely understand that communication and seamless communication is is always critical. So we do have, um, it, we don't know this as a known problem among Vermont per, uh, members receiving services. In full disclosure, the the uptake of and utilization of the of the telemedicine service that was available pre-COVID for us was quite low. So I wasn't aware of any specific problems. We obviously are watching this very closely as we see a lot of service being shifted to the virtual environment. And so that's, this is an area of critical priority for us. In New York State where there have been concerns raised about um, provider communication, we have used the the RIOs, the, the regional health information exchanges to be able to wrap around that information as well as some internal workarounds that is based on claims to be able to push that information to the primary care physician. Thank you. Thank you, Mort. Are there other members of the public who wish to comment at this time? Hearing none, I wish to thank Dr. Kilby and Mr. Odorizzi for a, a very informative presentation. Dr. Kilby, we wish you had hung around Vermont after graduation from <laughs> UVM and practiced here, but. <laughs> I, have, I have many colleagues and friends that I visit when I come up, so I, I feel still very connected to the, to the provider community there. So if you're talking to any uh, colleagues and friends that uh, chose uh, um, the urban areas to uh, practice in. This might be a good time for them to reconsider and move to Vermont. I, I will make sure to remember to mention that. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. At this time, we're going to turn it over to Cigna, uh, Dr. Pierce, Anthony Kelly, and Christine Cooney. Um, and again, do you have a presentation that you're going to share? Do you want Abigail to do it or what? Uh, hi, it's Anthony Calley. Good afternoon, and thank you for the time. We do not have a prepared presentation. We did provide a link to our our website at, at Cigna.com uh, backslash coronavirus, which can give um, detailed information on on how we're supporting the the um, our customers during this pandemic. So I'd like to walk through um, what we're what we're doing, um, if it's okay with you. Certainly. Okay. Again, thank you for the time this afternoon. I appreciate the opportunity to, to spend the time and, and talk with you about what Cigna is doing. Um, let me first start by, by highlighting that Cigna is and continues to be available 24-7 for our customers and our providers in the community. So 
If our customers um, need us and need to reach out to us, someone's available to speak with them. Um, same with our providers uh, across the country. If they have questions, um, they can call in and, and talk with someone at Cigna. Um, we, as well, early on during this pandemic, the transition um, employees who do not need to be in the office to a work at home setup um, so that they can continue to be available for our customers and our providers. And we've also increased um, staffing support around claims to ensure we can continue to turn claims around um, in a timely manner and, and get those payments out to the providers. Um, we do also or have um, offered um, telehealth or virtual services. Um, we've been offering it for quite some time now. It is available either through your the Cigna, your Cigna customer. You can get it through your portal or you can also get it through the Cigna mobile app. Um, we have um, medical doctors available. We also offer telebehavioral health and we have recently launched teledentistry for our customers that need access to an emergency dental consult. Um, they're able to um, contact a, a dentist if you have the, the Cigna Dental program. Um, let me uh, start here at the top. Let me just walk through some of the things that we've done um, as well for our customers. So Cigna uh, was one of the first um, carriers to waive cost share and co-payments for COVID-19. Um, so we've waived the cost sharing for office visits related to COVID-19 and, and testing through um, May 31st. We've waived customer cost sharing and co-payments for COVID-19 treatment through May 31st. And we waived customer cost sharing for telehealth screening for COVID-19 through May 31st. We've also waived prior authorizations of transfers for non-COVID-19 customers if they're transferring from an acute inpatient hospital setting to an in-network um, long-term care or other subacute facility setting. We are providing free home delivery for of, of up to 90 days supplies for maintenance medications that are available through our Express Script Pharmacy and 24-7 access to a pharmacist. We've also partnered with Bowie Health, which is an artificial intelligence powered navigation platform to provide free web-based interactive triage um, to assess COVID-19 risk. We also are offering a free on-demand webinar for the general public with tools and techniques for stress management and building resiliency. We're also offering uh, resources for all customers, clients, and communities to support them um, during the times of high stress and anxiety with a 24-hour helpline to connect um, people directly with qualified clinicians um, to help provide support and guidance. We have a, um, as I mentioned, our teledentistry, which is available to, to Sigma customers. We have um, also a dedicated internal team to answer customer questions related to COVID-19 billing or claims questions. Um, in addition to customer support on the provider side, so we have our national platform for our provider network and we have um, collected and we continue to monitor provider questions and concerns nationally, not just in Vermont, but with providers also outside of Vermont. And we've created on our provider portal an easy to use um, accessible link for the provider community to see um, what the Cigna um, billing requirements are to be paid um, for the services they are delivering, whether it be virtual care, um, or COVID-related um, services, testing, um, or treatment. Um, we continue to maintain that site. It's updated on a regular basis. So we continue to take provider questions that have come in nationally, and we add them to our provider's frequently asked questions site. And we'll also update our billing guidance and requirements as necessary, whether it be through executive orders that require it to be changed, or whether it be through feedback that we've collected from providers um, across the country. Um, to communicate that information with the provider community, we've, we've um, done social media posts, we've emailed providers, um, hundreds of thousands of emails nationally. We've also made personal outreaches to um, small, large groups and big delivery systems in our markets and across Vermont. Um, we've hosted phone calls with the providers to walk them through and 
help answer any questions they have live. We've spent time with the hospital associations and markets um, across the region as well as with the medical societies to answer any questions they have and also participated in um, government sponsored calls um, similar to this one to answer questions related to how we're supporting our providers in the community and the services that we're offering um, to our customers in the community. Um, Cigna is um, also uh, covering uh, the COVID-19 screening testing, um, whether it be laboratory testing with no cost share um, for our customers through May 31st. Um, we're allowing um, for accelerated hospital long-term acute care transfers um, um, and waiving the prior authorization requirements for that. Um, let me just step through here. So for virtual care, Cigna is allowing providers to, to bill for um, services that would have been delivered in a face-to-face -face setting um, and be reimbursed for those as virtual care. Uh, we are not um, putting requirements on face-to-face -face at this point. So if they deliver the, the care, whether it be through telephone or through video, um, whether it be through our MD Live partnership or through it through the local providers' offices, they're able to um, receive that care and the providers can, can bill for that and get paid for it. Uh, we are monitoring claims and we're looking for all COVID-19 related claims as they come in. And we're looking for scenarios where a provider may have billed it a claim incorrectly. So to avoid payment to a provider, rather than denying the claimant claim for incorrect billing, we're actually um, proactively outreaching to those providers and we're walking them through um, how they need to correct the claims to get paid. So we're trying to avoid any time delays in between um, claim, um, claim denial um, and getting paid. So we're, we're trying to be proactive there and walking those providers through that. And we're also looking for scenarios where they may have used all the right diagnosis codes, but maybe they missed a modifier and we're trying to get those claims processed and paid quickly without having to deny the claim back to the, to the provider. Um, we are also offering virtual care for occupational um, speech therapy um, through May 31st. And um, we, again, we're encouraging our providers to visit our provider portal. Uh, many of them across the country, including Vermont, are accessing it today. And we continuously update that with new information around um, any new billing guidance that we have related to, again, either executive orders or through um, changes that we make um, from feedback from providers to, to make claim uh, payment easier or billing easier for the, the local provider. Uh, and let me just pause here for a moment. Dr. Pierce, do you have any um, additional ads before I continue? I think that's a good momentum. If there's other things that you wanted to add, go ahead and then we'll open for questions. Okay, great. So um, we have uh, also created in partnership with New York Life, the Brave of Heart Fund. Um, both New York Life and Cigna committed $25 million or contributed $25 million to start the fund with a goal of reaching 100 million. And the fund is set up to um, support or provide funding for the frontline healthcare workers that are impacted by the COVID-19. Um, and if there are um, healthcare workers impacted by it, they can fill out um, an application for funding at www.braveofheart.fund.com. And that was set up. I believe that website, if it's not available um, live yet to, to fill out the application, it will be up there shortly. Um, so providers and communities um, all across the country can, can apply for that support. And uh, I think that's it. Um, I walked through that kind of quickly. Any questions? Okay, we're gonna open it up to the board. Uh, Maureen. Uh, I'm fine. I think that was, uh, I think when you go last uh, presenting after the other two insurers, we've already covered, you know, a lot of this. And so it's it's refreshing to see, you know, all three are really going at this very, in very similar manners. But thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, thank you. My only question is how many members do you have in Vermont? Uh, so I don't have the, file, the current numbers in front of me, but about 50,000, uh, if I have the numbers right. 
Thank you. Okay, Robin. Hi. Um, thank you for joining us. It's great to get an update from Cigna. Um, I was curious uh, about your self-insured business because I think the vast majority, if not almost all of your business in Vermont is self-insured, and whether uh, you were seeing adoption by self-insured employers to similar policies to what you outlined today. So I want to make sure I understand the question. You're, you're, you're asking if our self-insured employers have adopted the policies? Yes. Um, so, so yes, um, largely uh, they have their, um, for the treatment component of it, 95% of our, of our clients have adopted the, the um, coverage with no cost share. Great. That's great news. It's helpful for us to get a sense of how it's impacting Vermonters because particularly in your case, uh, your, a lot of your business is self-insured. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I was also curious if you have been thinking about either in Vermont or in other states where you do business, um, fixed prospective payments for providers uh, and whether that's a payment policy that you'd be interested in looking at or pursuing. So the, the question um, has come up, and it, it's something that we, um, we've heard from providers. At, at this time, we're not doing it. Okay. It's something that we are certainly looking at um, as a benefit both for cost containment as well as stability in our all-pair model and our ACO program in Vermont. So um, we would encourage you to think about it in that context because we really are trying to do an all-pair approach here. So just was curious uh, your take on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm good, thank you. Yes? Oh, thank you. Um, I guess my question revolves around some of the similar questions I've had of the other carriers and it'd be helpful for just for consistency to understand What's happened to your claims experience in terms of what's happened to hospital medical claims, professional medical claims, and drug medical claims, and your membership experience over the past five to six weeks? So it, it um, so a lot of providers, as, as was mentioned earlier, have um, postponed elective procedures. So we would, you know, we're expecting to see a, a decline related to that. Um, uh, however, I do not have a detailed financial summary that I'm able to share publicly at this point. Uh, we continually are monitoring our, our claims, our experience, and our volumes. And we'll, if we have a report that I'm able to share publicly, I'm happy to, to come back to the group. Uh, Christine or Tiffany, anything to add there? No, that's, that's the stage. It's really monitoring at present. Can you repeat that? I didn't hear the last speaker. We're still monitoring claims at present. Okay. Well, we, we also, to the degree that um, the board has, there's opportunity for confidential submissions, it would be, we can talk further about whether that might be uh, a potential here to share confidentially. But thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you, Jeff. At this time, we'll open it up to the public for any comment. Does any member of the public wish to make a comment at this time? Hearing none, I'd like to thank the team from uh, Cigna. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's been fascinating listening to our, our three principal insurer, insurance carriers in the state of Vermont this afternoon. And certainly a lot has been done to um, try to help in this unprecedented uh, time. So we thank you. And at this time, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So move. So move. Second. Been, moved, been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you, everyone, and um, have a great rest of the day.